Warhammer Fantasy. The End Times. Nagash. I have seen this world's demise. More sleep, the cursed orb waxes against crimson skies. Magic rises and reality subsides, leaving only madness in its wake. Vermin cease their gnawing and swarm to the surface, answering their horned master's call. First to fall are the temples of the Old Ones, abandoned by defenders who know that the end draws near. Mankind does not recognize its doom, not yet. They hear only the drums in the north, and know that war is coming. Some will fight. Others will abandon reason, seeking salvation in scripture or the scourge. They are deceived. The Dark Brothers are stronger than ever before, and the old gods fade. Only in death will any respite be found. In a land of mist, the danger is closer still. Pride has ever been the folly of that shrouded land, and so it will be again. When the dragons fly as one, an ancient lie will at last be exposed, a revelation that will shake Orthwan to the roots of its mountains. The mirror of light and dark will shatter, and Anarian's heirs will fight for the legacy of Cain amidst the ashes of the Phoenix. The Three-Eyed King has long awaited this moment, the hour in which his destiny is at last unveiled. He leads an army of madness and rage against which no sane being would willingly stand. Perhaps I am not sane, as I will fight one last time. Not for victory, but for survival, for the hope that a spark can endure. It is a slender hope, and the laughter of dark gods rings loud in my ears. Indeed, these are the end times. Advocate Tecto, speaker of Hexawattle's sacred council, knelt silently before the Golden Dares. A telepathic summons had brought him to mighty Mazdamundi's meditation chamber, and he had expected to find the slan already awoken. Instead, the Great One remained motionless, save for the steady rise and fall of his chest. Tecto could not tell whether Mazdamundi was lost to meditation or to dreaming, and there was no way to know until the slan chose to grant him enlightenment. It mattered not to Tecto. The speaker had been summoned, and he would attend upon Mazdamundi, wakeful or not, until dismissed. Tecto felt the humid mists of the chamber stir as another entered through the golden gateway. The newcomer wore the feathered mantle of Quetzal, he who protects, proclaiming his sacred duty to safeguard Talaxtalan. Turning away from silent Mazdamundi, Tecto rose to his feet and offered the ritual bow of greeting, as was protocol. Warleader Krokgar confirms that the Dark Ones cluster about the city of Echoes in great numbers, proclaimed High Scale Chief Inkala. He requires reinforcements to contain them. Despite the stifling warmth of the meditation chamber, Tecto felt a chill settle upon his scales. Nothing had been the same since a twin-tailed comet had returned. Already the Ratmen had begun to rise around Itza and Talaxtalan, and now ruined Zahutek was once more under the sway of the old enemy. Tightening his grip on his staff of office, the priest calmed himself. Cold times were ahead, but the Great Ones would guide them through the chill as they had before. Three grand cohorts were granted to him already this lunar cycle, he told Inkala. This breaks all precedent. 
Indeed, the other replied. Yet still he requires more. Many have fallen in Zahutek's defense. Krokgar asks that the Thunderscale cohort be allowed to bask in the battle's heat. Tecto's lids slid closed over Bulba's eyes. The Thunderscale cohort were Exolatl's foremost guardians, and not likely sent to fight elsewhere. Is the situation that dire? The war leader believes so, Inkala replied. We should trust to his intuition. Tecto stood silently for a time, tail flicking from side to side as he considered. Already, the geomantic web shudders with the Dark One's presence, he said at last, opening his eyes. Krokgar shall have what he requests. His instincts have never failed us before. We should heed him now. I shall give the order, Inkala confirmed, turning to leave the chamber. Wait! boomed Mazdamundi. The word echoed around the chamber, halting Inkala in his tracks. Both skinks turned to look upon the slan, roused at last from his silence. Tecto felt warmth enfold him as the Great One made telepathic contact. Images flooded through Tecto's mind, scenes of slaughter and destruction, of jungles of fire and temple cities cast into ruin. He saw the cursed moon loom over the skies, heard the chittering of rats, felt the cruel laughter of the Dark Ones in his mind. He witnessed two elves, one dark, one light, duel across a sea of skulls, whilst around them great armies gave battle without quarter. That vision quickly faded, replaced by images of human cities overrun by grasping vines and twisted trees. Across the world, the dead of ages tore free from their graves, mustering beneath one oppressive will. Tecto saw the mountains fall and the seas rise, the land torn asunder and the skies shatter. In the end, darkness swallowed all. The telepathic contact severed abruptly, and Tecto fell forward against his ceremonial staff, his breathing shallow and quick. What is it? What did you see? Inkala asked, the feathers of his headdress bobbing as his head twitched from side to side. Tecto trembled as he sought the words to describe the vision, but already the images were fading from his mind. They scattered like the echoes of dreams, even as the priest tried to recall them, leaving behind only a memory of stark terror. Fire and destruction, Tecto muttered weakly. The comet is no omen of hope. It is a portent of doom. You speak the impossible, Inkala objected. The comet is Sotek's sign. Tehen Huan declared it to be so, and the Great Ones confirmed it. And perhaps Sotek returns, Tecto rejoined. But the comet brings only death. There can be no stopping what is coming. This cannot be, countered Inkala. The Great Plan! The priest fell silent as Master Mundi's corpulent bulk shifted from the dais. The great plan has failed, the sign intoned heavily. The exodus must begin. The beginning of the end. The world was dying, but it had long been so ever since the coming of the Chaos Gods. For years beyond human reckoning, the gods had coveted the physical realm, had sought to infect it with their madness. They had sent demonic legions to conquer it by force, seduced mortals to their cause with honeyed words and the temptations of glory. Even the physicality of the mortal world warped under their influence, their magical lifeblood corrupting the soil and the air, until no living thing escaped their touch. Many times did the Dark Gods breach the barriers between the realms, but each time heroes arose to confront the madness. Through deeds of valor and sacrifice, the demonic legions were cast back into the blasphemous realm that had sired them, and those mortals who had fallen into the Dark God's grasp were slain or driven out into the wilderness. Alas, 
These victories were fleeting, for the gods are eternal, a mortal fortitude all too brief. Each time the circle soon began again, heralded by a twin-tailed comet in the northern skies. Each time the corruption was more widespread and the carnage more glorious. Each time the gods retreated, so too did magic recede as the barrier between the realms healed. Yet these wounds never truly closed, and the mortal realm was never truly free of the gods' magic or the strife that came with it. As the millennia passed, great nations arose from amidst the strife, bastions of order in a world awash with chaos. However, though these realms were strong without, they were hollow within, and they were maintained by hatred and distrust, ruled through pride and fear. Such emotions were as meat and drink to the gods, and they feasted in defeat almost as greedily as they did in victory. The mortals unknowingly crafted their own downfall, for even their triumphs hastened their inevitable doom. Thus, as a twin-tailed comet was again seen in mortal skies, the dark gods flexed their husbanded might once more. The barrier between the realms fractured, and the trickle of magic into the world became a flood. Storms of roiling, unadulterated chaos swept across the mortal realm, lashing the lands with arcane fury. Blood fell as rain, seizing and searing wherever it touched living flesh. The skies and fields blazed with multicolored fire, the clouds and stars twisted into leering faces to witness the destruction. Proud cities that had stood for hundreds of years collapsed into fetid squalor as the water they relied on for life turned black and noxious. Everywhere, Mortals were overcome by selfish desire and wanton impulses, throwing themselves into the most obscene and blasphemous of acts. The storm spread quickly, for neither mountain nor ocean could stay their passage. From out of these maelstroms marched the demonic legions, loosed once more to wreak their master's vengeance upon the world. While the demons of corn wrought bloody carnage, Zinch's emissaries pulled upon interwoven schemes thousands of years in the making, reveling at how the mortals danced as the strands shifted and unraveled. Nogal's plagues blossomed and spread, ushering mortals into fevered death. But even then, it was whispered that the Plague Father had ordered the creation of a pestilence that would overshadow all that had come before it. And Slanesh's handmaidens, they too acted according to their nature, bestowing upon mortals joy so rare and exquisite that the death they granted quickly afterwards was both the kindest and cruelest of acts. The world over, mortals prayed with a fervor they had never known before. Some prayed to the dark gods, and so surrendered their souls to blackness. Others prayed to their own sainted deities, and these walked with hope and disappointment for the final fleeting days for the other gods had faded as the Chaos Gods had arisen. In every city of every land, seers, madmen, and prophets spoke of the end times, of the fiery doom of the world brought nigh. Even the boldest felt a frisson of fear to hear these words pronounced, and they hoped that the portents would yet prove false. Discord broke out amongst the blasphemous ranks, for the demons of the different gods were as varied in character as the deities that had spawned them. In many places, the demons forgot the mortals altogether and turned on one another, transforming great reaches of the world into hellish battlegrounds where the slights and insults of millennia were at last repaid. The gods cared not, for their appetites were vast and their palates simple. Strife was strife, and it mattered not from which fields the harvest of suffering was reaped. The gods supped of the heady brew their minions had created, and grew stronger for the tasting. And, as the gods might swell, so did the woes unleashed upon the world increase. However, victory yet eluded the gods' grasp, for though the tides of chaos were rising, 
they were not yet at their height. Many storms of magic collapsed as suddenly as they broke, banishing the demons once more to their distant realm. The hold of Karak Izor was besieged and battered by such a tempest, its defenders assailed by so vast a legion of blood-starved demons that they fought on only from defiance with no hope of victory. Then, without warning, the storm scattered upon the winds, replaced in an instant by blue skies. The bewildered dwarfs, their mail rent and shields dinted, were left staggered, unsure whether to maintain their shield walls or bury their dead. Elsewhere, the river Ava turned to blood and birthed a slavering host that overran every town and village along its banks. Only Averheim survived the onset, and then only because the demons faded within moments of reaching its walls. Alas, seldom did suffering end with the demons' departure. When the maggot king Epidemius brought his festival of disease to Middenheim, pox-scarred victims were sent to the fires long after the fly-swathed host had departed the packed streets. Even after the lurid flame ceased rising over Tor Aker, cackling demons haunted the nightmares of all who slept within the city bounds, and many such dreamers never awoke, their souls stolen away from their slumbering bodies. In Tylia, the town of Trantio was, for three days and three nights, engulfed in a swirl of perfumed murk. No two stones lay together when the storm lifted. The demon wrought destruction was so complete that not a single building survived, and every soul trapped within now served in manners both horrific and diverse before Slanish's silken throne. In many places, the breaches between the realms were larger and more stable, and there were fought the bloodiest battles of those days. In Lustria, the vast rift in the heart of Zahutek was torn open anew. Although the lizardmen had long prepared for that moment, and had surrounded the ancient ruins with troops and wards untold, the onslaught was only contained, not defeated. As the days of unrelenting battle ground on, the Saurus cohorts were gradually driven back. In Othwan, Ivres was all but overrun, as the demon Nakari led his legions forth from the enchanted mists to bring suffering to the High Elves once more. In Athel Loren, the vaults of winter cracked asunder and spewed legions of demon kind into the glades of Summerstrand. Yet, all these incursions were as nothing compared to what occurred at the world's North Pole. At the sight of the greatest rift between the mortal and immortal realms, there the demonic legions congregated in numbers beyond measure, marshalling into four great hosts of damnation assembled beneath the most exalted servants of the Chaos Guards. It was an invasion of a magnitude not seen for thousands of years, the beginning of the end, a declaration of the death of the world. One by one, the four exalted demons bent knee in fealty, not to a god or another demon, but to a mortal man, a traitor to his own kind, chosen by the dark gods to be their agent of annihilation. For the acts he would perform, so had the gods named him, he was Archaon, ever chosen, Lord of the End Times, and the hour of his glory was fast approaching. The coming of the demons heralded a time of dark rejoicing for the barbarians of the Chaos Wastes. For long months, the shamans and seers of the northern tribes had read signs of glory in the stars and omens in the shifting winds. The black moon hung heavier in the skies each day, green flames raging across its surface and sparking into the void, waves of dark blessings rippling through the tribes with every flare. A twin-tailed comet blazed across the sky, its wake branding the heavens with sigils of flickering fire. Tidings spread that Archeon had at last ascended to his throne of bone and brass, the crown of domination set upon the ever-chosen's brow by unholy Belakor, the first damned. Truly was Archeon the lord of the end times, highest in the sight of the Chaos Gods, 
and their weapon against the world. Such was the ever-chosen's glory, or so it was said, that even the immortal servants of the gods now offered him fealty. Not all believed that the demons intended true allegiance to the ever-chosen, for the legends of the Northlands were repeat with tales of how such creatures obeyed only when it served their own interests, but it hardly mattered. There would be opportunities for the strong, the devious, and the devoted to win the favor of the gods. Tribes beyond counting were drawn north to the inevitable city, their chieftains driven by ambition to kneel before Archeon's grim throne. As each night fell and the dark moon blazed overhead, drums boomed through the darkness. Bellowed chants echoed south across the waste, tens of thousands of voices raised in guttural clamor. All who heard that ancient prayer felt something impossibly old and hungry stir in their souls. Lunatics, souls, and demon-touched wanderers found their steps guided northwards by unknown compulsion or by the insidious whispers dancing in their minds. As the winds carried the dirge south across the old world, even faultless souls who had never heard the call of the dark powers felt its summons. A few, too few, resisted, drawing upon the strength of dwindling gods to preserve their fragile sanity. Some went mad, scooping out their eyes so that they might blind themselves to their unwanted visions, or hacking out their tongues to keep from uttering blasphemous truths. Others welcomed the changes that were upon them, sensing at last the fulfillment of a need that they had never before acknowledged. In Bretonia, in the great cathedral of Gizarro, a bishop suddenly compelled to anoint the lady's fountain with the slime from his own blackened sores. As contagion rippled through the pilgrims who drank from the waters, he bellowed with laughter. A terrible blood-choked sound that gave out only when his lungs collapsed beneath the weight of the writhing maggots within. In Altdorf, a sister of Shalia completed her morning's devotions, took up a carving knife from the refectory, and slaughtered those with whom she had lived and worshipped for two decades. When the city watch finally breached the temple a day later, they found her sitting amidst bloody and half-eaten bodies. The captain of the watch made the mistake of thinking her catatonic. Soon he had a ragged gash where his throat should have been, and she had a sword as well as a knife. Thus began a trail of carnage, that stretched to the border of Troll Country, and ended at last in a hail of bullets, somewhere on the Nordvast Streckhein Road. All across the old world, soldiers turned on their comrades before fleeing into the beastman-haunted forests, or north into the chaos wastes, humanity slewing from their minds and bodies with every step they took. Hour by hour, day by day, Archeon's army grew, its numbers swollen by traitors and madmen from the south. Yet still the ever-chosen made no move to march. Many chieftains grew restless. They chafed at the inactivity and longed to raise their axes against the weak nations of the world. Some warred amongst themselves, but others led their tribes south in search of plunder and victory. Archaon cared not. The horde could not be controlled. He knew that well enough but it did not matter. The Eye of Shirian had granted him a vision of the future, of a world swallowed by fire, in which civilization had crumbled, and every voice exalted to the glory of the Chaos Guards. This future was not to be brought about by war, as the civilized world had so far seen it. This would be war without end. The realm of Chaos was rising, and those not swept away at its onset would drown as the dark waters closed over their heads. Let others be the first to break upon the shore, expending their strength before the full swell of the tide. Let the weak and worthless be winnowed out. Let the reckless and glory-mad grind themselves to offal against offences long prepared. They were of no consequence. Those who survived would be the stronger for it. Those who perished would glorify the gods with their deaths. 
Soon the Sword of Chaos would raise Archeon's banner, and the greatest horde ever seen would march to cease history. The end times were upon the world, and Archeon's hour was nigh. As elsewhere, Northmen spilled south across the Ironfrost Glacier into Nagaroth. Their banners were black against the storm-laden sky. The tramp of their iron-shod feet, a rumble of thunder in distant lands. This was the bloodied horde, and Valkyr was its dread mistress. She had heard Korn's voice bellowing through the thunderous skies, and now drove her followers south to claim skulls in his name. The Gore Queen cared not for Archeon's strategy. She knew only that Korn called for blood, and thus she set forth to slake his monstrous thirst. The horde marched with harsh cheer and boom of drum, yet, incredibly, the Nagarathi were caught unaware. Too long had they relied upon the sorceresses of Grond to alert them of such perils, but the Tower of Prophecy lay silent behind a shield of sorcery. Raven-cloaked border patrols fled before the Northlanders, turning their swift steeds south towards the safety of the watchtowers. One by one, the dark riders were overtaken by yowling demons and plucked from their horses. Only a handful reached the Tower of Volroth, there to perish from their wounds. Yet, the warning had at last been given, passed from tower to tower until it reached Nagarond. Ebnir Soulflare, most trusted of the Witch King's generals, rode to Volroth with what forces he could muster, but found the fortress already fallen. The once proud obsidian walls had been torn down by the roaring spawn creatures of the Chaos Wastes. All that remained of a garrison some eighty thousand strong were towering cairns of bloody skulls. Solflare set his army to the slaughter of those invaders who had tarried amongst Volroth's shattered spires, but the bulk of the bloodied horde had already passed beyond the line of watchtowers. The Northlander invasion splintered as it headed further south, its chieftains abandoning Valkyr's path to claim skulls of their own. The Gore Queen stayed true to her course, sweeping aside the Nagarothi hosts arrayed against her and laid siege to grim Nagarond. Other warbands travelled east to assail Harganath, and there found themselves assailed by warriors whose thirst for slaughter eclipsed even their own. Some chieftains headed south, only to be confronted by the cold-hearted legions of Hag Grief. Malice Darkblade proved himself an inspired war leader in those weeks, bearing the dark road with the corpses of the slain. However, the Lord of Hag Grief sought only to prevent the Northlanders assailing his city. He cared not if Nagarond fell, so long as Malekith fell with it. Yet of Malekith, there was no sign. It was Kuran Darkhand, faithful master of the Black Guard, who led Nagarond's defense. Twice he faced Valkyr in single combat as her army stormed the walls, and twice the duel ended in stalemate as the tides of battle swept them apart. Alas, whilst Kuran was an adroit and loyal soldier, he lacked the spark of brilliance to break the siege. As the conflict dragged on, the lords and ladies of the Black Council were torn between desires. As much as they wished for the Witch King's return, so that he might smite the Northlanders for their impertinence, so too did they fear Malekith's wrath on seeing what had become of his realm. At last, after three months of siege, the Witch King returned. Of where he had sojourned, he offered no word, and none dared ask, just as they dared not ask whose dried blood was crusted thick upon his gauntlets. Some said he had travelled through the realm of chaos, others that he had trod the gloom of the marais, but none could say for sure. Initially, Malekith was of good humour, though this dispersed like blood in the chill ocean as his council apprised him of the realm's woes. It had long been the Witch King's plan to commence a new assault against hated Ulthwan, but such a thing was impossible whilst Nagaroth was beset. Calling the dragon Seraphon to his side, Malekith cast the bloodied horde from Nagaron's wars and ordered the return of all Nagarothi forces bound for Ulthwan. Ancient vengeance would wait until the upstart invaders had been taught the folly of their actions. Worthless, all of you, worthless, Malekith shouted, 
slamming his fist down on the stone table. Dried blood flaked from the gauntlet, speckling the map with crimson dust. Kuran watched as carved finger bones, each marking the last known location of a barbarian horde, skittered across the inked expanse of flayed skin. As a cartographer, Rath Blacktongue had been a severe disappointment. As a map, he was invaluable. Perhaps fifty inner counselors, all that could be swiftly assembled following the breaking of the siege, were present in the shadowed chamber. None of them spoke. No one wanted to be the first to draw the Witch King's attention. Curran marked those who had flinched as Malachi's fist had crashed down. Those were the ones who lacked the courage to defy their master. Those were the ones that could be trusted. Most of the council wore solemnly respectful expressions, Curran noted, but not all. Malus Darkblade, bastard ruler of Haggrief, could hardly hide his triumph. Something would have to be done about that one, Kuran decided. If his spies could be believed, and Kuran had tortured too many to death over the centuries to think that more than a handful had the stomach for misleading him, then the ambitious Darkblade was gathering allies for a rebellion. Something would have to be done about him, and soon. Our campaign against hated Of One will be delayed until the barbarians have been humbled. Malachith continued in a dangerous whisper, his temper perhaps subsiding. Accept our apologies, Lady Brackblood, for we know that this was to have been your finest hour. The Witch King's temper was under control once more, if it had truly been roused in the first place. Even Coron could not always tell when his master played at rage for a theatrical effect. To Coron's left, Drain Brackblood gave a predatory smile. Your Majesty is most gracious, she said, her voice like silk torn on broken glass. She had plotted long and hard to be given command of the invasion fleet, Coron thought, but she knew better than to express her disappointment in council. That would be taken out on her household, and, if rumour held true, the very special prisoner chained in the deepest dungeon of her man's. All forces at anchor in Nagarond and Haggrief are to disembark and begin the march north immediately, Malachith announced. We shall take command of the counterattack personally. He paused. But perhaps some consideration should be given to our royal mother. She has, after all, proven to be a good and loyal servant in the past. Kuron watched as Malachith's gaze tracked around the room. Despite being couched in terms of royal favour, this was a dangerous and thankless task. Who would be chosen? He was too valuable at Malachi's side. Ibnir Soulflayer, perhaps? He certainly deserved worse for his failure in the north. Or maybe Hellebron. There was amusement to be had in sending the Blood Queen of Harganath to aid her greatest rival. But Koron suspected that even Malachi could ill afford to offend the cult of the murder god. Lord Darkblade, the Witch King said at last, chill regard dripping from every syllable. Perhaps you will do us this very personal service. Be assured you may choose the finest warriors at our disposal to accompany you. Kuron watched with secret amusement as Malus Darkblade's mask slipped for a second. The dread Lord of Harganath plainly understood the perils of the mission, but he could hardly refuse. Darkblade bowed his head. Of course, your majesty. Understand, Darkblade. We are concerned that there may have been an element of treachery at work in the north. Take any action you think proper, but know that we expect our mother to be returned to us unharmed. All other concerns are secondary. Perform this task and perform it well, and we shall prove not ungenerous. But be warned. We have had more than our fill of failure. It shall be as you command, Majesty, Darkblade replied, his intellect doubtless at work already. Kuron let his mind wander as discussion turned to the details of the forthcoming campaign. The natural order of Nagaroth had been restored, or nearly so. The barbarians would be crushed, and, with luck, at least one ambitious scut would meet a deserved demise. Today had been a very good day.
and those that followed promised to be even better. On Ulthwan, the lull of Nagarothi attacks did not go unnoticed. Shores that had known scant peace in the preceding centuries went weeks without sighting a black sail upon the horizon, and even in the war-torn shadowlands, the bitter conflict between the divided houses of Nagarith was stilled for a time. Alas, the High Elves had little chance to revel in this unexpected calm, for the rising power of chaos soon made its presence known in the Ten Kingdoms. On a night riven by red lightning, the clouds atop their Nulei mountains descended, a tide of wild magic flowing in their wake. Wherever the mists touched, madness followed. Trees twisted into vile shapes and bellowed in a language that was old when the world was young. The creatures of the sunlit meadows fled before the magic's onslaught or else warped into new and terrible forms. Spirits of the rivers and the hills screamed in agony as the power of chaos flooded through them, then cackled with laughter as their broken minds came to glory in their remade bodies. Of all Ulthwan's creatures, only the elves were unaffected. They had resisted the influence of chaos for millennia. They would not succumb now, nor would they willingly surrender their beloved homeland. Wherever the magic flowed, the walls of reality wore thin, and demons poured in through the breaches. In Safari, the shores of the Sea of Dreams came alive with rising tentacles. The forests of Chase burned, as Zinchian hosts set warp fires for no reason other than to revel in the destruction. The rivers of inland Gothic and Illyrion flowed thick with festering slime as the noxious emissaries of Grandfather Nurgle brewed contagions amongst the headwaters. Howling hosts of bloodletters ran rampant across the elven heartlands, putting towns to the sword and claiming the skulls of the slain for their dark masters. The great cities of Elysia and Tor Dinal were overrun by the screeching hordes. The walls of Tor Akar, the Tower of Hoeth, and countless other fortress cities were brought under siege. Here and there the elves succeeded in stemming the tide of corruption. Banners were raised across the Ten Kingdoms, and armies marched to oppose the demonic assault. Protected from the demonic malice by the steel of Safarian swordmasters, Elven Magi drew upon every known shred of sorcerous lore and dispersed the roiling magic into the great vortex. Such was dangerous work. No few mages lost their sanity in the striving, minds driven beyond the precipice of reason by demonic whispers. Only in Evres did spear and bow alone hold the tide at bay, for the mistwalkers of those parts had long fought such threats. Now more than ever, the elves of Orthwan looked to the Phoenix King for guidance, but Finubar was nowhere to be found. The official word from the Phoenix Court was that he had sealed himself in the heaven-like tower and, with solitude his only companion, cast his mind upon the winds of magic to divine the cause of the unfolding disaster. At first, this was sufficient to quell the mutterings at court and beyond. However, as time passed and the situation grew ever more dire, discontent began to spread through the noble halls of Ulthwan. With Funobar isolated from the world, the task of leadership now fell to the Ten Kingdoms' greatest heroes. However, many of these were still overseas, returning from a failed rescue attempt. Eliathra, firstborn daughter of the Everqueen, and thus destined to one day be the Everqueen herself, had been captured by the vampire Manfred von Karstein. Tyrion and Teclis, the heirs of Anarion, had led the expedition to Nagashazar, but the fiend had spirited the Everchild away at the very hour of his defeat. Others came forth to bear the burden. Imric of Calador, last of that kingly bloodline, fought tirelessly throughout many lands not his own, as did Morvai of Tyrannoch and Caradriel of Etain. But it was not enough. Little by little, the elves were losing control of their ancestral lands, Trace and Kothic were now all but overrun. Illyrian and Avalorn seemed sure to follow. Hope was fading. Not only was the Phoenix King nowhere to be found, but the Everqueen, warned by a mother's intuition that Alethara's dire fate had not been averted, had abandoned her beloved Avalorn and had retreated to the Gairn Vale. 
So it was that when Tyrion and Teclis returned in failure, they did so to a land overrun and a council divided. Teclis was appalled. He quickly perceived that Imric's motives were mostly honourable, but he saw also the division that the Dragon Prince had wrought. Though not an adept of strategy, it was plain to Teclis that too many battles were being fought not to martial advantage, but to further Imric's cause. Those who supported the Dragon Prince could rely upon the full might of Kalidor's armies in return. Those who opposed him were left to fend for themselves. Deeming there to be no other choice, Teclis resolved to breach the wards about Heavenlight Tower, to intrude upon the Phoenix King's private sanctum went against all tradition, and Teclis was guarded with his intentions. It took the mage three days to prepare an incantation that could defeat Finobar's wards, and another to perform it. Yet finally the spell was complete. The protections faded just long enough to allow Teclis to enter the room. When he emerged again at midnight the same day, he was paler even than normal. Tyrion had spent the day since his return to Althwan, preparing another expedition to rescue Aliathra. He had spared little attention for the horrors engulfing Althwan, and none at all for the growing political divisions. Thus, when Teclis arrived and begged Tyrion to take command of Althwan's armies, the prince was less than receptive to the idea. Torn between the calling of his heart and his duty, Tyrion travelled north to the shrine of Asuyan, his intention to seek the Creator's guidance. With him, he took but two companions, Eltharion of Ivres and Princess Erdira of Tyrannoch, the one grim as a Nagarothi winter, the other as wild as the wind. These two were his most trusted confidants, and the only elves other than his brother with whom he had shared the truth concerning Aliathra. The door to the muster hall swung open at a wave of Teclis's hand, and the mage passed through into the chamber beyond. This was one of the oldest mansions in Tor Alin, dating back to the reign of Kalidor I. How much longer would it stand, Teclis wondered. How much longer would anything on Orthwan endure in these dark days? Tyrion stood in the centre of the room, his palms braced upon the top of the silverwood table, his eyes focused on a map of the upstart empires of men, and occasionally darting to a scroll that contained troop readiness reports from across the Ten Kingdoms. To Teclis's certain knowledge, he had been here for at least a day and a night. You must not leave Althwan, Teclis said, crossing to his brother's side and glancing down at the map. Not even in order to save Aliathra. I must, Tyrion replied in a tone that invited no argument. This task cannot be left to other hands. She is the future of our race. Is she? Teclis asked sadly. You've never been able to lie to me, brother, he sighed. I always wondered what evil our bloodline's curse would wreak through you. Now I know a part of it. If our most ancient of legends is true, then we were doomed long before Aliathra was taken. You doomed us, Tyrion, long before then. What could have possessed you to commit such folly? I would never expect you to understand, Tyrion snapped, sweeping back his hand dismissively. You have ever been passionless and distant, fonder of your dry and dusty tomes than of anything that walks and breathes. It astounds me that I can be so misjudged by one who knows me so well, Teclis replied icily and turned wearily away. He knew his brother's anger was not directed at him, but it cut him to the quick nonetheless. Shaking his head, Teclis drew himself up to his full height once again. I did not come here to quarrel, brother, he said, his face still to the door. I came to discover the truth, and I have done so. I shall not speak of it to another, not to the council, not even to the Everqueen herself. Would you have me do nothing? Tyrion demanded quickly, his anger cooling into something altogether more dangerous. Would you have me abandon her? I would have you be the leader your people need in this time of blood and fire, Teclis said softly, turning to face his brother again. Even if you save her, Aliathra can never be the Everqueen, 
and if you depart Othwan, thousands will perish. Can one life, any life, be worth so much death? There was no answer, so Teclis pressed on. I will weep for your daughter later, brother, for now it is the fate of our entire race that concerns me, as it should concern you. Unless we can find a way to cheat fate, the Asur will no longer be anything other than a memory. I will see the world itself unmade before I allow that to happen. What will you do? Whatever I must, Tyrion replied darkly. But will you do it to assuage your guilt, or to protect a people who rely on their greatest champion now more than ever? Teclis felt his brother's baleful glare upon him, but the mage met it unflinchingly. Teclis sighed. Very well. I know the folly of trying to change your mind once it is made up, and I too have errands that will not wait. With a sweep of robes, he turned and strode briskly towards a door, but paused for a moment on the threshold. I forgive you for what you have done, brother. I only hope that when the time comes, you can forgive me for what I must do now. As the three travellers approached their destination, they found the causeway blocked by the serried ranks of the Phoenix Guard. It seemed the whole shrine had emptied, for the length and breadth of the causeway was resplendent with shining armour and gleaming cloaks. They would not allow Tyrion to pass, but stood shoulder to shoulder as the travellers approached. Drawing back on Malhandia's reins, Tyrion demanded to know the reason for this display. At first, there was no answer. Then, as one, ten thousand knees bent and ten thousand blades lowered in fealty. Artharion counseled Tyrion that this was the sign he had sought and bade the prince remain on Othwan to take command of the realm's defense. He and Eldira would lead an army to rescue Aliathra from the clutches of the undead, or they would die trying. Tyrion looked into Artharion's shadowed eyes before nodding and turning back to Lothurn. Tyrion returned to the Phoenix Council at the height of one of Imric's speeches. He entered the room in full armor and challenged every lord there to lay aside their differences and marshal their forces to the fence of the Ten Kingdoms. If any sought to quarrel further, he declared, then he would happily settle such arguments with Sung Fang's keen edge. All there present were shamed by Tyrion's words or were cowed by his manner all save Imric, who flew to his feet and demanded under what authority Tyrion dared speak so. Anarion's heir smiled without humour and told the dragon prince that he was but the herald of Asuyan, and of the phoenix king who was the creator's mortal servant. Under such authority there was nothing he would not dare. A cold rage now descended upon Imric's heart, declaring that Caladon would stand alone he swept out of the chamber and abandoned forever his dreams of claiming the phoenix crown. Soon, a great host marched out of Lothurn, with Tyrion and the phoenix guard at its head. With them rode the lords and warriors of nine kingdoms. Imric had stubbornly clung to his pledge and refused to look to the defense of any kingdom save Calador. Nonetheless, when Tyrion's host marched, it did so with hope rekindled. The elves swept north along the shores of Itain and Safari, and thence into Evres and Avalorn. They cast the demons back into their loathsome realm, and Teclis used ancient magics to halt the spread of the mists. Tyrion fought with a fervor the most accredited to his bloodline, or else to the blessings of the guards. Only Teclis, who battled ever at his brother's side, knew that Tyrion's determination grew not out of supernatural means, but out of frustration at his duty to fight for his homeland while Alithra languished in Manfred's clutches. A second, smaller army, with Altharion and Eldira at its head, took shape east a few days after Tyrion's army had marched forth. They had no illusions about the dangers before them. Belenair, Lord Master of Hoeth, travelled with the fleet, leaving Finrir to guide the majors of Sephiri in his stead. He could hear the Everchild's voice upon the wind, and had determined 
that Alethra was now held captive in the region known to men as Sylvania, land of the vampire counts. It was plain that Alethra's capture was part of some dark plot, and Belanair advised Eltharion to seek aid from the other nations of the old world. Eltharion had resisted at first, for he loathed that Alethra's fate could be placed in the hands of men and dwarfs, but at last he relented. The forces of darkness and destruction were on the march, that much was evident. Better that Orthwan ally itself with willing primitives, he judged, than stand alone in defeat. Swallowing the last of his pride, Altharion ordered the ships of his fleet to head due east for the Empire of Sigmar. In the Empire, times were bleak and growing steadily bleaker. The portents had not gone unnoticed in the land of Sigmar, though few realized the ominous times that proceeded in their wake. Many looked upon the twin-tailed comet and saw only hope, a renaissance of power and perhaps the return of their ancestral warrior god. Then the skies blazed with multicolored fire, and the priests reminded their congregation that Sigmar had come during a time of mankind's darkest need, and warned that such times could well be nigh once more. And so it proved. As the comet grew brighter, the Drakwald was alive with rumor concerning a being the commoners named Malagor. For centuries there had been tales of this winged beastman, Stories of villagers cursed and crops blighted by the coming of the one they called the Dark Omen. These stories had always been discounted as superstitious drivel by the learned men of the cities, but now Gregor Martak, head of the Amber College, claimed to have caught sight of the creature amidst the ruins of a small village near Middenheim, and the naysayers had fallen suddenly silent. By day, travelers, caravans, and patrols vanished from the Drakwald's roads. By night, commoners cowered behind boarded-up doors and windows, praying that Tal would preserve them from the howling beasts beyond the palisade. On the comet sped, past glowering Morsleib, and cases of mutation flared, not just in the squalid rookeries of the cities, but amongst the wealthy classes as well. Some of the afflicted, her dark singing upon the winds, abandoning their lives, they journeyed north, lured by a growing darkness in their hearts and minds. Disease, too, had soared, most prominently in Altdorf, where the sisters of Shalia woefully declared the blight immune to their prayers. Thinking that the outbreak was an artifice of evil men rather than the will of cruel gods, Archlector Caslain led an expedition into the Umberogan ruins buried deep beneath the city, but he found naught in those tunnels, save for rats and a sense of mocking eyes watching his every move. In response to the sickness of mind and body, unscrupulous merchants amassed fortunes in gold crowns, selling tinctures and elixirs that would proof one against the stigmata of chaos. Seldom did such palliatives work, for most were simply coloured water or even distillations of poisons. None of this mattered to their vendors, who had invariably moved on to the next market by the time the deceit was uncovered. Not all escaped, however. In Middenheim, the elector count Boris Todbringer strung such a merchant from the city walls after he lost a nephew to a lethal infusion of Hagbane and Doxnare. The elixir trade in Middenheim was noticeably curtailed after that but it continued to boom elsewhere in the lands of the Empire. Cure peddlers were not the only ones to profit from the doom-laden times. Doomsayers and zealot priests found their congregations burgeoning with believers as importance became ever more frequent and malign. As the flagellants' numbers swelled, so too did they become more violent. When the twin-tailed comet sailed past noble Mansleeb, state troopers were mobilized in several cities, to aid watchmen in containing the baying crowds. In Nuln, even this proved insufficient. The city was overwhelmed with fanatics to such an extent that the nobility scarcely dared venture beyond the walls of their estates. As it transpired, walls were no barrier to the mob, and the mansions were soon ransacked for valuables. Bonfires were lit on every street corner, fed by the possessions of the wealthy. Some nobles were imprisoned, 
others were pilloried. The Countess von Liebwitz would have been sent to the bonfire as a witch and adulteress were it not for the actions of a retired dock watch captain. Gathering a desperate band of watchmen and militia, this captain rescued the Countess from the flames, reclaiming the city's old quarter and held it long enough for the Knights Griffon and reinforcements from Reichland to finally quell the riots. As the twin-tailed comet sped past the constellation of Kerr, the Slayer of Fiends, Manfred von Karstein seceded Sylvania from imperial rule and cloaked the province in impenetrable darkness. Volkmar, grand theogenist of the cult of Sigmar, was overcome by righteous outrage. Spurning cautious counsel, he plunged headlong into Sylvania to confront the vampire. He did not return. Worse yet, Sylvania's border was soon fortified with towering ramparts of bone, and those witch hunters who managed to escape the cursed land spoke of an apostatic enchantment that rendered even the most potent of their holy weapons useless. The only glimmer of light in a dark situation was the fact that Balthazar Gelt, arch-alchemist and supreme patriarch of the Colleges of Magic, had succeeded in crafting an enchantment of his own. Dubbed the Wall of Faith by those who had learned of it, Gelt's spell encircled Sylvania, drawing upon the power of holy artifacts that Manfred had sought to place beyond use. No undead creature could cross that invisible barrier, or so it was said, but for many, this was still not enough. All things being equal, not even the staunchest of traditionalists would have objected to the loss of that benighted region, for it had ever been a reluctant and burdensome province. Alas, all things were not equal, and the Emperor's Council feared that Sylvania's independence was but the precursor to a new campaign of terror. At Karl Franz's order, the armies of the Empire began to converge upon Sylvania, determined that gunpowder and steel would serve if faith would not. There were those in the Emperor's inner circle who cautioned that Manfred was likely prepared for such an attack. However, Karl Franz took the view that Sylvania had gone from being an occasional dagger in the Emperor's side, albeit one that had several times come close to victory, to an open threat he no longer had the authority of overlooking. If the vampires could not escape Sylvania, then they would be cornered and destroyed. Then came the riders from Kislev. Sergei Tanarov, boyar of Chebokov, and his escort of Ungol horsemen came to Altdorf at dawn, two days before the Emperor was due to depart for the Sylvania campaign. The comet was now so bright in the skies that it was visible by day, a second sun peering down from the heavens. The Kislevites had risen their steeds half to death and carried dire news. The Northlanders were on the march once again. Kislev was already half fallen. Tanarov warned, with all of the lands north and west of Bulgazgrad awash in the sea of barbarians and demons. Given the severity of the news, Karl Franz had expected the Ice Queen to invoke the terms of their old alliance and call upon the Empire to march north to Kislev's salvation. Tanarov made no such demand. Kislev was already gone, he said, and went on to tell of a series of battles along the river Linsk Battles the Tsarina fought not out of hope for her own people's survival, but so that the Empire might have time to avoid a similar fate. Within the hour, hundreds of heralds had set out from Altdorf, beginning the task of strengthening the northern border and redirecting those armies already nigh upon Sylvania. Nevertheless, Karl Vrans knew the situation was grim. He had fought alongside the Gospodars of Kislev many times, and he knew them to be a hardy and resourceful people, if they had all been but swept aside. For the next few weeks, the fate of the Empire hung in the balance. Armies were forced march north in a desperate race to reinforce the border before the Chaos Hordes could break through. Many of the troops who began the journey never reached their destination. Beastmen and greenskins, hungry for slaughter, harried the advance. Soon, Karl Franz's logisticians and strategists advised that certain tracks of the Great Forest and the Drakwald be avoided entirely. Even then, the attrition continued. Entire regiments were wiped out as plague spread through their ranks. Some soldiers perished from exhaustion, abandoned to the roadside by comrades desperate to continue their advance. Others deserted, 
fleeing to their homes to protect their loved ones. All in all, for every ten men that headed to the Kislev border, only seven reached their destination. Those who did survive the journey found themselves fighting almost from the moment of their arrival. The Chaos Hordes, winnowed of their weak and feckless during the fighting for Kislev, had spilled over into the Empire in many places, and the armies of Ostermark and Talabakaland were hard-pressed to keep them at bay. Most dangerous of these was a ragged host marching under the banner of Village the Kersling, where other hordes shattered against the Empire's entrenched battle lines. Village's followers pressed on, insensate to the losses inflicted upon them. Thus was Castle von Rauken besieged, and only a series of brilliant harrying attacks masterminded by Aldebrand Ludenhoff, the Elector Count of Hochland, saw the fortress preserved. Yet for all of Ludenhoff's successes, he could not raise the siege, nor could he stem the tide of Northlander reinforcements. The room was full of candles, but the girl sat in shadow. Only the sleeves and skirts of her long white dress showed in the darkness, and Balthazar Gelt wondered again why he had come. The signet ring that accompanied the message was to be trusted, or so his father had always told him. But for it to summon him here, of all places, even the air stank of decadence. Sit, please, the girl's accent marked her as a foreigner, Gelt thought. One of the mountain provinces of Bretonia, Montford, or perhaps Paravon. Thank you, but I prefer to stand, Gelt replied, as you wish. Can I offer you wine? I must decline. Must you indeed? The girl reached out a lace-gloved hand to the decanter on the table between them and poured herself a polite measure of the ruby liquid. All Altdorf speaks of you as the jailer of Sylvania. An exaggeration, I assure you, Gelt answered carefully. The concept was not even mine. No, he thought. It had been young Dieter who had suggested the idea. It had been an uncharacteristic display of cleverness from an otherwise unpromising acolyte. Such a shame that he had been found dead two days later, his throat torn out as if by a wild animal. One more victim of the von Karsteins, Gelt supposed, perhaps a last, if all went well. Ah, but it was your genius that saw it enacted, was it not? the girl asked. Perhaps. But it does not take any genius on my part to know that you did not summon me here to say as much. Deliver your message and let me be on my way. I am not accustomed to patronizing such establishments. You take issue with the decor, perhaps? The girl's amusement was plain. I disapprove of the trade, Gelt corrected. You needn't fear for your reputation. This is a house of discretion among other things. Indeed, you of all people know that we are none of us what we seem on the surface. The girl took a sip from her glass. As to the reason for the meeting, I already told you. To express your admiration for the caging of Sylvania, Gelt made no attempt to hide his disbelief. Indeed, suddenly serious, the girl leaned forward, though not so much that her face left the shadows. You should go further. Explain. You have delivered the southern provinces from the menace of Sylvania, but what of those to the north? A melding of magic and faith could serve there as well. What if you could fashion a rampart that not only kept out the barbarians, but sustained itself from the wild magic that gives life to the demonic? Such a thing has never been done. Of course it has, the girl laughed. The world is far wider than this tiny realm. She pushed a withered scroll across the table, revealing a delicate hand, which she withdrew quickly. Magic is rising. Much is now possible that was not before. Gelt unfurled the scroll and poured over its contents with growing surprise. The ritual it described would be a great undertaking, but it might very well work. He would not have considered such a strategy before the triumph over Sylvania, but he had found his horizons broadened of late. Yet still, he had his doubts. But what manner of genius would I be if I succumbed to such transparent manipulation? What manner of genius would you be if you did not? 
the girl countered, levity once more in her voice. In any case, I have delivered the message as I was bidden. I care not what you do with it. May I ask who sent you to me? You may, but you would be a fool to expect a reply, the girl said sharply. Suffice to say that I am no fonder of her than she is of me, but strange ties make for strange alliances. Those last words stayed with Gelt as he made his way back through the busy streets. He knew that there was more at work here than he could see, but he would think on the matter. He would think very hard indeed. The first real successes came with the arrival of troops from Altdorf. Karl Franz had not yet joined the fighting in the north, for he had bent his efforts to seeking assistance from the old world's other realms. His efforts had, as yet, failed to bear fruit, for it seemed every land teetered upon the brink of destruction. Even the dwarfs were strangely reluctant to commit their aid. Nevertheless, the emperor persevered in his attempts and, in the meantime, was generous with the forces under his personal command. So it was that Ludenhoff soon found himself the master of fully half of the Reichsguard, as well as a great many regiments from Altdorf and Reichland. Thus reinforced, the Elector Count of Hochland was able to at last inflict meaningful defeat on the barbarians. He relieved Castle von Rauken and, at the Battle of Lubrecht, personally placed a long rifle bullet in the back of one of Village's skulls, forcing the sorcerer to retreat. Bereft of their master's guidance, the Kerslings' host scattered to the winds, and for a time, the Empire knew hope. Then, as the twin-tailed comet reached its perigee, outriders and ungall horsemen brought word of other hordes of Northmen drawing south across the steppes, hordes that far eclipsed those thus far encountered. Ludenhoff's army, the largest empire formation yet that fought in the north, barely outnumbered even the smallest of the newcomers' forces. In Altdorf, Karl Franz heard tell of the worsening situation and redoubled his diplomatic efforts. If the Empire were to endure this war, it would need allies. If there were no allies to be had, it would need a miracle. As the Empire battled for survival, the insidious influence of chaos continued to spread. With every orbit since the coming of the comet, Dark Morsleep had drawn closer to the world. Now, beneath the moon's leering face, the firmament began to rise. From the ground rose monoliths, Jagged spikes thrust out of the bedrock like spear points. Some were black splinters of long ago meteors, now pulled to the surface by the moon's sickly green glow. Others were ancient idols, toppled and overgrown, or else cast down into ruin by other powers. As the nights grew longer, dark magic re-knitted broken stone fell ruins, a long eroded cast forth baleful light once more. From the Drakwald surged a monolith so immense it towered over the tallest structure built by man, its crown wreathed in lightning. The malformed pillars that grew in the Arden forest oozed, while a monument of living flame arose out of the glacial fields of Nagaroth. The dreaded six spikes heard stones, leveled after the loss of so many stout-hearted men, once again stood tall in the great forest. A number of contaminated sites arose in Athel Lauren, despite the best efforts of the Wood Elves. So each of these herd stones pulsed with dark energy, emitting the corrupting influence of chaos into the air around them. And from out of the dark woods came the Beastmen. Primal needs called them, savage lusts drove them. Answering a summons they did not understand, the two children of chaos gathered. They came alone or in packs, whole war herds following the ancient paths through the wild places of the world. They were joined by twisted and mutated things not seen by light of day for generations. They converged at these sites of power, drawn to the newly risen herdstones and those long established. As the congregations milled, the dark acts that followed were as unnatural as the creatures that performed them. The raucous rites followed no pattern, there was no discernible ritual. Instead, it was naught but a blood orgy, a savage feast where depravity and anarchy held sway. Gory trophies were stacked high as more and more of the beast-twisted kind emerged to join the grisly bacchanal. 
The grounds grew slippery with blood and the fruits of debased acts. Through it all, braying howls were lifted to the moon, as its strange rays imbued all with a grotesque and unquenchable vitality. The strongest gathered there, and the herd stones whispered dark secrets long promised, the fulfillment of dreams beyond the comprehension of reasoning creatures. A myriad scents and sensations all said the same thing. The time of the beast was coming. For the folk of Atholdoran, the resurgence of the beastmen could not have come at a worse time. The Battle of Quenelles had been won, but at a terrible cost. Ariel was dying, and the forest was dying with her. So far as any knew, the Mage Queen had come through the battle unscathed, but her strength had failed the moment she had set foot within the forest bounds. A somber procession of eternal guard had borne Ariel away to the Oak of Ages, hoping that she might heal within, as she had many times before. A week later, the first signs of rot appeared upon the Oak of Ages' boughs, and the sickness soon spread throughout the forest. Glades that had gone unaffected by the shifting seasons since the first turnings of the world withered. Madness spread like wildfire through the dryads and treemen, and ancient trees cracked asunder to spill their maggot-ridden innards upon a forest floor heavy with decay. To make matters worse, beastmen were drawn to these desolate glades in their thousands. These were not merely the herds that perennially roamed beneath the forest canopy, but mutants and brayspawn lured from hundreds of leagues in every direction. No matter how desperately the Wood Elves fought, the Children of Chaos were never repulsed for long. All Athel Loren despaired. None amongst the Wood Elves could deem the cause of their queen's sickness, though they all believed it to be tied to the forest's plight. Some speculated she had been cursed during the dying moments of the Battle of Quinelles. A few claimed that the Malays had been visited upon by the Lady of the Lake, an act of retribution for a recent quarrel. However, most saw their queen's sickness as a sign that the balance of the weave was shifting, that the terrible events that they had fought so hard and so long to prevent were at last upon them. Alas, just as none could identify the source of the blight, none could posit a cure. Orion, desolate that he could heal neither his home nor his beloved queen, sought refuge in battle. Again and again, the wild hunt rode out across the ravaged glades and swept away all in its path. No malformed beastman was safe from Orion's wrath. Alas, in his sorrow, the king in the woods grew ever more reckless. Soon it was rage, not reason, that came to dominate his thinking. Thus did many wood elves perish in needless battle, victims of their king's grief as much as the crude weapons of the children of chaos. Denied the guidance of both king and queen, the Council of Athaloran could not divine the proper path. Several months after Ariel had first begun to diminish, a new intruder came to the forest. She travelled through the world route, a perilous journey for one not born of Athaloran, but she came alone, appeasing their guardian spirits with offerings of purest magic and innocent blood. Of course, none could tread the ancient trails of the world without the Wood Elves' knowledge, and when the intruder stepped out into the light of the king's glade, she faced a ring of leveled spears. So it was that the folk of Athelorn greeted Ariel, ever queen of Ulthwan. The Wood Elves beheld Ariel with distrust. Their relations with Ulthwan had improved much in recent years. The betrayals and slights of old were not easily forgotten. Nonetheless, Ariel was granted an audience before the full council, and she told them of the circumstances that had driven her eastward. She spoke of her daughter, Aliathra, held captive by the malice of the vampire Manfred von Karstein, and of the failed attempts to rescue her. As a mother, Ariel wept for Aliathra's fate. As a queen, she feared the doom her daughter's death would wreak upon Ulthwan. But Ariel's fears went deeper even than this. She too had felt the shifting balance of the weave and feared that the ever-child's fate was part of some larger calamity, one that might forever upset the fragile balance between the powers of life and death. She told the Council of Etharian's mission to save Aliathra, but she told them also that she did not believe the High Elves could win this battle alone. 
So saying, Ariella abased herself before the council, an act that none there expected of so proud a queen, and she begged the Wood Elves to send whatever aid they could, if not for Ariathra's sake, or for Orthwan's, then for that of the world. Long did the council debate Ariel's request. Few had any desire to weaken Athel Lauren's defences against the rampaging beastmen, nor could they ignore the wider consequences of refusal. If the weave sustained lasting harm, Athel Lauren would be first to suffer, as it had done in the past. But could the Ever Queen's reading of events be trusted? None was sure. Ariel had spoken without guile but this was no guarantee that she herself had not been deceived. In the end, the matter was settled by an unexpected influence. Durthu, eldest of ancients, had seldom addressed the council in recent decades, for his mind had been too often far afield, but now he spoke lucidly and without wrath. The cycle of the world was beginning anew, he proclaimed in stentorian tones, and just as the forest had aided the elves of Orthwan in days of old, it would do so again now. But he warned Ariel, there would be a price, just as there had been in those ancient times. The Ever Queen knew nothing of the events to which the Elder referred, but she accepted without hesitation. The council, unwilling to contradict Durthu's decision, ordered that a host be assembled to pierce dread Sylvania and aid the High Elves in their rescue attempt. Perhaps this might also restore balance to the weave and to the forest. This task was entrusted to Araloth, Lord of Talsin and Ariel's champion, for it was well known by now that he commanded the fervor of the goddess Lilith, and such would serve him well in the dark land of the vampires. Araloth's host set out in the dead of night, striking north towards Axbite Pass. Their course took them close to the walls of Paravon. Duke Cassian, Woken from his slumber by a sentry's call, wondered what errand drew the fey folk eastward, then drove the idle fancy from his head. But Tonia had enough problems of its own. The moon was full overhead as Ariel stood in the heart of the great clearing. There was an ancient power in this place, the Everqueen knew. She could feel the slumbering consciousness pressing at the back of her mind, a thousand echoing whispers, all different, yet all the same. It was the sweetest music she had ever heard. The trees of Avalon had never sung to her thus, not in all of the years she had walked their groves, and, for all the strangeness of Athel Lauren, a part of Ariel felt that it had at last come home. This had been a magnificent tree once, Ariel thought, staring at the glorious crown of branches high above her head. Perhaps it would be so again, but now its leaves were withered and shrunken, its bark peeling and marred by livid spotches of color. She ran her fingers across the trunk, but snatched them back in dismay as the bark shriveled at her touch. The sisters who had guided her to the clearing looked at her expectantly. The Oak of Ages, Nestor told her solemnly, it is dying. It is perhaps already dead, said Arahan. Can it be saved? Alariel asked. This is not for us to say. Nestor replied. It is for you to prove, Arahan said. Or to disprove, her sister echoed. With a creaking sigh, the ground in front of Ariel sunk away, revealing a stairway of roots that stretched away into the darkness beneath the tree. Pinpricks of light sparkled in the gloom below as spirits, disturbed by the shifting of the roots, flittered into the night sky. The Everqueen felt an unfamiliar pang of terror. There is nothing to fear, Nestor said. Do not lie to her, Arhan chided. It is better she knows the truth. Truth is not absolute, whatever you might believe, Nestor argued. In any case, the bargain is made. It cannot be reneged upon without cost. A cost we can ill afford, Arhan agreed. Indeed, but you are right, Nestor conceded. The choice must be hers alone. Ariel's grip tightened on her stave. Nestra was correct, she thought. The bargain had been made. The Everqueen would not dishonor the Asur by refusing it now. Without a word, Ariel began her descent. The soil's rich scent was thick all about her, but the bitterness of corruption also hung in the air. 
As she alighted from each step, the roots shifted behind her, rising up to weave away the sky. As the last tendril writhed into place, the Ever Queen heard one of her sisters call out, Please, save our mother! When the folk of Bretonia, common born and noble alike, recalled the horrors of recent years, they concluded that the kingdom was surely damned. First had come the year of woe, when demons had ravaged the four corners of the realm. Then had followed the uprising of 1543. Malabord, bastard son of the king, had long been gathering an army in Musalon. And on winter's eve of that year, he loosed it to seize the throne. Disgraced knights from across the realm flocked to Malabord's serpent banner, and, as King Luan, Ryark of Bretonia, gathered his own scattered armies, the situation worsened. After the Battle of Chalons and the calamitous disappearance of Morgiana Le Fay, the Dukes of Carcassonne, Lyonnais, and Artois declared themselves for Malabord, and rebellion blossomed into civil war. At first, the forces of the king had the upper hand. Malabord's followers fought with the desperation of traitors, but the lady's blessings lay within those who rode at King Luan's side. One by one, Luancourt bested the treacherous dukes and brought their rebellious provinces to heel. A year into the campaign, it seemed that the serpent's hour was done. It was then that the true depth of Malabod's evil was revealed. He had struck a pact with the ancient lich Arkan the Black, and as the serpent's human allies founded, the dead marched to swell his ranks. By the time Leoncourt faced his bastard son at the Battle of Quenelles, Malabord commanded a horde far greater than the king's army. So dire had things grown by this point that the elves of Athol Loren lent their strength to King Luan's cause. In the end, for Bretonia, it was all for nothing. At the height of the battle, Malabord fought Leoncourt in single combat and cast his father's broken body into the mud. With their king's fall, the Bretonians lost all will to fight. They fled the battlefield, leaving the Wood Elves to make what escape they could. As to the fate of the king, no one knew. Some said that seven sisters had borne him from the battlefield and carried him north to the Silver Spire so that the lady herself could heal him. Others said that the king had perished from his wounds and was buried high on the hillside above the city he had fought to save. The darkest of the rumors said that Leoncourt still walked the southern provinces, a mindless thrall to the necromancers, who were Malabord's allies. Whatever the truth of the king's fate, his absence harmed Bretonia greatly. Unity fled the land. Each duke was ill-inclined to aid another province, while his own lands were beset. One by one, the southern provinces fell, and Malabard drove his army north to Couron. With his hour of victory close at hand, Malabard would not be stayed. The traitorous prince's shadowy benefactor had promised that no mortal son of Bretonia could lay him low, and Malabard proved the truth of those words time and again. At Gisero, Adelaide, Montfort, and a hundred more, he offered a challenge to any knight who would face him in single combat. Each time he emerged victorious without so much as a scratch. Yet, in his arrogance, Malabard forgot that not all of Bretonia's champions were truly mortal. When the bastard prince's army of the dead reached Coron, he found the surviving dukes of Bretonia united against him once more, their banners raised together. This mattered not to Malabard, whose army far outnumbered the one assembled against him. Once again, he sent forth his challenge to combat, but this time it was no mortal duke or baron who answered, but the Sacremor, the legendary Green Knight, returned from the Lacrimora in the hour of his people's need. In that moment, Malabard recognized his doom, but before the prince could flee, the Green Knight spurred forward and struck the traitor's head from his shoulders. With its master slain, Malabar's army was soon overcome. However, Arkan the Black had long since fled, and no trace of him could be found. In the aftermath of battle, Malabar's body was burnt, his ashes scattered to the winds. With victory at last achieved, the Duke's thoughts strayed to the succession. By now, the Dukes believed Leoncourt slain, 
and with no obvious heir left alive, each sought to take the throne for himself. Civil war could have begun anew at that point. Indeed, it would have done, had not the Green Knight revealed himself to be none other than Giles Le Breton, the founder of the realm. Gifted new life by the Lady, in order that he could lead his people once more. Awestruck, the dukes immediately ceded the throne, and the folk of Bretonia had reason to celebrate at last. Or so they thought. The prophecy of Giles's return promised that he would lead his people in their darkest hour. In their rapture, the Bretonians believed that those words referred to the now-ended civil war. They were to soon learn that they were wrong. Days after Giles' re-coronation as Royarch, plague broke out in the southern provinces, laying waste to what remained of Quenelles and Carcassonne, then came Warpstone meteors, blazing from the skies to bring death and mutation to the ravaged land. With each passing day, the power of chaos waxed ever fuller, and Bretonia's plight grew ever more desperate. Each night, the skies blazed with blue fire, and each morning the survivors praised the Lady for their salvation or else slunk into the woods in shame, their bodies writhing with mutation and minds lost to madness. Emboldened by their swelling numbers, the beastmen warhoods roamed the land. Shrines, villages, and even towns were wiped off the map as the children of chaos exulted in the bountiful favor of the gods. The forest became filthy and corrupted places where only the foolish dared to tread. Even the blessed sites where grail chapels stood were not immune, and many Grail Knights perished trying to stem a tide of corruption that had no end. On one wild night, when the wind screamed with the voices of the damned and blood-red rain fell from the skies, the city of Bordelot vanished without a trace. A great keep of brass and bones stood in its place. The skulls of the vanished citizens set as trophies upon the walls by the same cackling demons who prowled the surrounding lands. Through it all, the Knights of Bretonia did not sit idle. Many embraced the dark days as an opportunity to prove their valor, to perform deeds worthy of legend and song. Yet their bold examples were but pinpricks of light in the choking gloom. A quarter of the population had been slain, by demon fire, by plague, or by kin strife, and another quarter had fled over the mountains, seeking safety in the lands of the Empire or Tylea. Even as Bretonia rejoiced at Giles' return, it lamented the horrors heaped upon it. The peasants grew ever more sullen and miserable. The nobility looked out across what had once been the fairest land in the old world, and wondered what they had done to deserve such a fate as this. From his throne in Cowron, Giles marked the land's malaise, and knew it a harbinger of more perilous times to come. Summoning his heralds, the Sacramor declared an errantry war, the scope of which would surpass any before it. The sons of Bretonia were the most valiant in the world, he decreed. They would not wait meekly while the realm crumbled around them. The land would be cleansed, the creatures of chaos slaughtered and driven into the ocean. Bretonia would ride out once more, for honor, for the king, and for the lady. Far to the east of Bretonia, High King Thorgrim Grudgebearer brooded. He could see the world was changing, and not for the better. From atop his throne, nestled in the great hall of the Everpeak, he pored over reports, more and more of which were brought to him every hour. All were tidings of ill portent, and beneath his magnificent beard, his scowl grew. The dwarfs had ever been a dour race, and a grim mane is as much a part of their character as is their habit of pointing out the decline in everything that has taken place since the days of their forefathers. However, even a race that likes to find fault was shocked at just how ominous the signs were. Long dormant volcanoes rumbled, and the very foundations of the planet shook and trembled. Even the steadiest of veterans, those hoary elders whose beards had grown longest, conceded that they had never witnessed such a multitude of troubles, nor had they themselves been as full of foreboding as they were now. From atop lookout towers, amidst the snow-covered peaks of the world's edge mountains, the dwarves looked out upon the oncoming storm. They marked the encroaching murk of the Darklands, 
a rising tide of gloom, broken only by meteoric strikes of sickly green that blazed downwards from the cursed moon. They observed enemies gathering in numbers hitherto unseen by living dwarfs. The Badlands, those breeding grounds of greenskins, were bursting their borders, and every day brought more ogre tribes stomping out from the enshrouding dark of the east. Something awful was brewing in Sylvania, for its borders grew hulking battlements of bone to encircle the land, while clouds of black magic swirled overhead. Along the slopes, dire beasts stirred and from their slumbers with a greater frequency and ferocity than even the oldest, most malcontent tellers of tales could recall. From the north came the most menacing and portentous sights of all. Strange lights writhed upon the horizon, and arcane gales swept across the lands. Reports from Krakadrak, that most distant of strongholds in Norska, spoke of demons scouring the lands and a great mobilization. The barbaric warriors of the Dark Gods amassing. Old beards who remembered the black days that preceded the great war against chaos conceded that the looming signs looked every bit as threatening as those which heralded that infamous invasion, maybe worse. These grim tidings were the reason Thorgrim brooded. Although his people had waned since their golden age, that time when the mountain kingdoms were filled with riches and the forgecraft of the dwarfs was at its lofty pinnacle, they still remained strong. Enemies crashed and broke upon their impenetrable holds like the tides. Time and again, the dwarfs marched forth to sweep away invading armies or to clear the highland passes of nightmarish monsters. Since that distant era, when their ancestor gods walked amongst them, the dwarves had endured. As the great Book of Grudges attested, they had overcome demonic incursions, mountain-shattering earthquakes, invasions from the north, and the greatest armies that their age-old foes could muster. Yet the prospect of facing each of these threats again, all at the same time, was daunting. Even Thorgrim, relentless avenger of his people's wrongs, was thunderstruck by the rising enormity of the task at hand. Some clans, including the influential Runesmith Guild, pointed to the swelling number of foes and pronounced it was time to seal the holds, to lock out the woes of what were sure to be troubled times. Then, as during past calamities, the dwarfs would be secure, protected within their matchless mountain fortresses, safeguarded while the surface world burned with war. While they would still be vulnerable to underground assault, those who swore the closed gates would be the dwarf's salvation pointed out the slackening pressure of their age-old nemesis, the night goblins and the verminous skaven. Many holes, amongst them Zufbar and Karak Azul, reported that the constant attacks afflicting the underway had recently slowed or halted altogether. However, those dwarfs most skilled in mining, those who ranged deepest into the Underdark, felt that this watchful peace was a lull, a sign that their wily foes were planning something ominous. They asserted their enemy was building up their strength, and some even made claims of uncovering bold new access tunnels that sought to undermine the dwarfs. As ever, Thorgrim Grudgebearer received his very counsels with a sour expression. He too looked upon the glowering skies, bestowing upon them the same heaped disdain with which he received the ill-omened reports. Seasoned with age and many battles, Thorgrim knew that his people were divided. Many still begrudged his decision to aid the elves of Ulthwan, a failed attempt to rescue the Everchild from the vampiric clutches of Manfred von Karstein. But the very idea of barring the gates and hoping to weather the looming disaster sat poorly with the High King. Though he was oath-bound to uphold the pledge to aid the Empire, Thorgrim knew that if he called for a muster of the holes, some of the kings would oppose any idea of marching to meet the rising threats head-on. King Kazador had already sealed the main gates of Karakazul. Such was the counsel of the greatest living runesmith, Thorek Ironbrow, who advised putting faith in strong walls rather than squandering aid upon wayward allies. Furthermore, the master runesmith personally petitioned the High King to put forth all efforts to recover ancient artifacts. 
for it was his hope to uncover some mighty heirloom of the ancestor gods to aid their cause. Thoric was adamant that he had almost uncovered the hidden whereabouts of the fabled portal stone of Valaya, the rune-covered post and lintel through which the ancestor goddess first stepped out of the living mountain. Long-trusted lore suggested the finding of such an artifact would mark the onset of a new golden age, a time when the gods would once more walk amongst their people. Of course, there were others who would more readily obey the High King's wishes, even if that required marching in force out of their own holds. Kin Arak of Carrick Hearn had sent his pledge of support to Thorgrim, while Ungrim Ironfist, the slayer king of Carrick Cadrin, was always looking for battle. Even King Belagar of Carrick Eight Peaks, under siege as he was, vowed to do what he could to serve his oaths to the High King. If the signs were being read correctly, every warrior would be needed, for a time of great calamity was fast approaching. Heavy sat the crown of the High King as he watched the sun set over his mountain realm. Thorgrim had vowed to strike out every entry in the great book of grudges or die trying, and Thorgrim was a dwarf of his word. War was in the air, spreading through the lands like wildfire. Smoke rose on every horizon, and clouds of carrion birds circled low, anticipating slaughter. With the promise of violence carried further by every gust of the rising winds, the orcs and goblins began to amass, readying themselves for a new and bloody age. Greenskins had always thrived on war. Individual tribes exist in a constant state of battle, feuding with foes, rivals, or amongst themselves, if no better victim can be found. However, sparked by the increased violence that now beset the world, the Greenskins gained a stronger focus. From the most skulking and weedy specimens to hulking war bosses, they all began to feel a pulse-quickening rush of indescribable but awesome purpose. It grew within them until they were bursting with energy. Yet despite the barely contained fervor, the infighting that constantly plagued their kind all but ceased. It was as if the Greenskins intuitively knew that such an act of belligerence would not satisfy them. Instead, the orcs and goblins pent up their destructive craving, holding it within until they could bellow to the skies and unleash it in one savage moment. Previously, an orc or goblin might go his whole life short and brutal though they tended to be, and only feel a twinge of such direction. Next to the pure joy of battle, this was the closest Greenskins ever felt to divinity, and now such feelings washed over them. The overwhelming feeling that something big was brewing struck Greenskins, no matter how far-flung they were. In the most remote of locales, lone tribes felt compelled to seek out and join others of their kind. From the deepest wilderness came nomadic tribes of savage orcs, while forest goblins emerged out of their web-strewn woodland lairs. In the north, beneath ominous clouds, tall country saw the scattered tribes begin to amass. Brutal war chants were lifted to the strange skies. Where green-skinned populations were highest, the rising tide of compulsion reached fever pitch, exponentially increasing until the green masses crackled with war energy. In the cave-riddled World's Edge Mountains, the night goblins gathered in great hordes, growing over-eager. Armies from out of the darkness of the wolflands howled at the strangely hued moon that leered down at them. The most active sight of all was the Badlands, an archic homeland to orc tribes beyond count. The region seethed with energy, a bubbling and overfilled cauldron ready to boil over, a powder keg awaiting only a spark. In that moment, the Greenskins could have dominated the world, launched a crusade to sweep across every continent if a single warlord could have united all of the tribes across the globe and harnessed their might into a unified nation, then no lone force could have stood before them. There were a number of powerful Greenskin leaders, and each of these drew off a portion of that gathered strength. In the northern range of the World's Edge Mountains, 
orcs and goblins flocked to follow Grimjaw Ironhide, pure violence distilled into a muscle-laden body of a black orc. Although perhaps the most ferocious fighter of his kind, Grimjaw lacked any real desire to lead. He relished slaughter and sought the hardest foe he could fight, but he cared not if an army followed him. In fact, when the green skins that flocked to his inspiring brutality got in his way, he carved a path through them with as much relish as he killed anything else. Naturally, this display of strength drew more greenskins to his banner, orcs and black orcs particularly. War Grimjaw was sprawling and dangerous, but its commander could not care less for conquering lands or ransacking towns, and instead marched north, seeking to challenge the great champions that gathered there. Little did Grimjaw know Little did Grimjaw know that his rampage had long ago been foretold. When it came to ambition, there was one greenskin who could not be matched. Skarsnik, warlord of the Eight Peaks. Countless tribes gathered around him. Chief amongst them were the Night Goblins, but many others joined him. Spider-worshipping forest goblins, iron-clad orcs from the mountain passes, and huge numbers of lumbering trolls. It was his intention to unleash War Skarsnik against the much-hated dwarf realm, but for good measure, he would eradicate any skaven that came within arm's reach, or, as the goblins put it, anything worth jabbing at. In the mushroom-filled great hall of his lair, formerly the dwarf hold of Karak Eight Peaks, the night goblin warlord promised plunder untold to the warlords, that had gathered to fight under his banner. In the heart of the Badlands, the drums of war beat night and day. Amidst the furore, Wurzag, great prophet of his people, searched beneath the gaze of the totems raised in those forsaken lands. Out of the thousands of tribes that amassed there, no less than a dozen warlords rose to prominence, splitting the gathering hordes between them. It had ever been Wurzag's dream to find one great war boss that could claim the favor of both Gork and Mork, an ultimate greenskin warlord who could smash the world asunder. Never had the off addled Wurzag moved with such clarity, never had his visions been more lucid. Wurzag flung and read the bones and then flung them again, letting them point him in the right direction. He vomited out pure green mystical energies bathing in the visions they supplied. Wurzag lurched and gyrated around the fire, doing his best shamanic war dance at each crude encampment he visited. Yet despite his frantic searchings, he met with no success. Dimly, Wurzag began to realize that perhaps he sought not one almighty war boss, but two, a fist of Gork and a hand of Mork. Not all his shamans could attune their mind like Wurzag and harness the surge of war energy, however. When surrounded by highly agitated members of their race, orc and goblin shamans became imbued with extraordinarily powerful magics. Some could not cope with the massive influx of power, their minds filled beyond capacity with rampant magic. These individuals were a menace to themselves and all around them, for when they could contain no more, they overloaded in head-bursting explosions that showered lethal energies in a deadly radius. Others who remained at least in partial control were able to vent the surplus force skywards, sending incandescent green beams into the heavens, there to tear apart the unnaturally low and brooding clouds. Beneath these ominous sights, the factious groups set off, each a roiling mass of troops, beasts and monsters, that began its own crusade of destruction. They were willing to fight anything and everything that got in their way. Once more, the world quaked to the resounding roars of the greenskin war. In the mountains of Morn, change was in the wind. Wild creatures were first to sense the shift, their instincts recognizing the rising signs. Soon enough, however, even the ogres themselves, ponderous and brutal as they are, had to acknowledge the portents. They could not fail to observe the multicolored lights that blazed brightly on the northern horizon, still visible through daylight. Nor could they ignore the fireballs that tore across the night sky, 
the blazing green contrails that stung their eyes to witness. Most of the meteorites fell in the darklands, but some struck close enough that their momentous impacts could be felt. Clouds of debris blossomed to mock the strikes, triggering innumerable avalanches and landslides that rumbled loudly into the valleys below. Most troublesome of all was the volcanic activity. The mountains of Morn are rife with volcanoes, and the ogres and the beasts of that land were well used to fitful rumblings or occasional eruptions. Now, however, all of them began spewing smoke and shaking the surrounding slopes. At first, this excited the ogres, especially when the father of volcanoes, the mighty Firemouth, sent forth great geysers of lava. The fire-belly priests who worshipped this living mountain god increased their sacrifices tenfold, hoping to placate his hunger and thereby earn his favor. Over the land, immense plumes of smoke mingled with the now oddly swirling clouds. Thus began a season of blood, as the unsettled atmosphere incited creatures to terrible feats of wrath. Beasts woke from long slumber and howled their anger from the snow-covered peaks. Rhinox herds clashed with wolf packs beneath the eerily luminescent second moon. Chimera, driven southwards by the growing turmoil in the north, terrorized the peaks, savaging everything they espied. Hunting minocores prowled everywhere, and no matter how much they killed, they could not satiate their bloodlust. The bellowing challenges of stone horns echoed over the valleys, and even ogres traveling in tribes' strength were not safe from attack. Many tribes entered into prolonged beast wars, titanic struggles to defend their valley camps from a near-continuous onslaught. Yet the ogres were not unduly troubled, for they were made for fighting and for survival under even the harshest of conditions. Instead, like a saber tusk coming across a bloody trail upon the mountainside, the ogres shrugged off all signs of lethargy and sloth, greeting the gale-force winds from the north with toothy grins. They knew that where there was fighting, there would be bountiful opportunity, and the ogres had eager expectations of the feasts to come. The ogres were no longer acting like a unified kingdom, however, breaking apart into many differing factions rather than a single nation. The bruising goodwill between tribes that over-tyrant Grisus Goldtooth had instilled with his triumph at the Battle of the Firemouth had, at least partially, dissipated. Grisus's great might and strong arm tactics ensured that a core of tribes remained loyal to him. However, ogres have always been independently minded and prone to spur of the moment reversals. Many tribes, particularly those of immediate reach of Grisus, forgot their oaths to their over tyrant at the first sign of improved opportunities for themselves. Given the choice of obeying the whims of a distant lord or availing themselves of a chance to immediately glut their desire for food and riches, many ogres followed their gut instincts. The largest number of tribes that split from their over-tyrant's rule resided in the northern reaches of the mountains of Morn. The barbarian humans of the Waste had put forth a call to war, mustering further to the north beneath the growling maelstrom. Promises of easy pickings had lured many ogres to join the Northmen, disappearing into the growing storm. Others, like Golfag Maneater and his army of battle-hardened loot masters, stomped off westward, heading for the smoke that hung over many of the passes and dwarf holes of the World's Edge Mountains. War was brewing there, as it was in the human lands beyond. Where there was war, there would be plunder. Led by the Thunder Guts and Rock Clubs, numerous tribes dared to enter the Badlands, where they rampaged amongst the swelling numbers of Greenskins, rising to the top of a hierarchy where might is right. Grisus Goldtooth was vexed to learn that his every word was no longer being obeyed. The over-tyrant was enraged that tribes were striking out to seek their own gain with no heed for his orders. For a fleeting few years, when Grisus could claim obedience from nearly every tribe within the mountains of Morn, he boasted a kingdom that could pit its strength against any nation in the world. And now, now he was watching it slip from his grasp, running through his fingers as slippery as the grease that oozes from a roasted joint. His wrath grew with each Noblar scout that brought him word of new defections. 
ogres do not overthink matters. Their way is to vacillate between two polar extremes. When victorious, they will wallow in slothful abundance, perhaps never satiated, but certainly willing to spend days and weeks on end doing naught but lolling about, shoveling food into their moors. When roused, however, be it by pride or hunger, ogres are like unto a force of nature, striking suddenly and with relentless fervor, plundering so as to leave behind only a ruinous wake. Greasus was an ogre who could out-eat any of his race, indeed, any five of his kind, but he had had enough of feasting for now. It was time, once again, to show his subjects the vast and domineering power he alone wielded. Greasus Goldtooth and his loyal tribes were a lumbering force that could strike fear into any realm and beat any opposition into dust. Then it happened. Even as Greasus gathered his tribes and set out on the trail of recently departed traitors, the firemouth erupted. The massive volcano vented its fury into the heavens as it had never done before. Such was the force of that fiery blast that it was visible even through the gloom that enshrouded the dark lands, a deep red glow that could be seen throughout all but the thickest ash fall. Furthermore, the firemouth's roar began a chain reaction. Up and down the mountains of war, other volcanoes began to erupt, joining in a hellish chorus that shook the land. So violently did the firemouth explode that the firebellies had to abandon its steep sides altogether, except for a few stubborn ogres who stayed and were swallowed by the lava. Amidst the dark rain and boulder storm, racing before the magna flow, the great exodus began. The ogres, all of them, were now on the march. It was a migration on a scale not seen since they left the ancient giant lands, and the world would pay a heavy price. The Skaven abided their time long enough. The Under Empire had always been a slave driven hive of activity, but now the Ratmen's frenetic pace accelerated. Every clan, stronghold, and underlayer swarmed with activity and ambitions. Grinding labor, plotting, warring, and even the brokering of interfractional alliances all had been ratcheted up to new extremes. It was as if the Skaven had all been injected with warpstone stimulus, which, in a few instances, was in fact the case. The Skaven network of informants had infiltrated many nations. Embedded across many kingdoms, these spies, turncoats, and moles were bursting with news. Meteors rained from the skies, volcanoes erupted, and unnatural storms swept the lands. Deeming the time was right, the ruling Council of Thirteen unleashed the first stage of their master plan. And with that, and with that surface invasion, a new era of Skaven domination had begun. Bodily leaving their lairs, the Skaven surged upwards in seemingly endless numbers. So did the kingdoms of Tydlia and Estalia fall, overwhelmed by a masterful campaign of sudden violence. Under tunneled and overrun, every major city was now a blasted ruin over which a ragged clan banner openly flew. Long lines of human survivors were chained and herded underground, new laborers to refuel the next stage of the master plan. The taste of victory only served to spur on the race of ratmen further. From ambitious claw pack chieftains to the rulers of the ascendant clans, each despotic tyrant recognized the opportunities. As war and ruin spread throughout the lands, their own time drew nigh. And so the Skaven drove their slaves cruelly, urging the abused masses onwards at a reckless pace. Untold numbers of them were worked to death, and their corpses served to feed those who remained. The verminous race had always grown via bursts of prolific upheaval. In the past, such surges were notoriously short-lived, typically followed by utter collapse. Yet this time was different. With the malefic winds growing stronger, with war entropy flooding into the air and with the green-hued moon looming larger every night, a natural vitality replenished the Skaven anew. The ever more frequent showers of glorious warpstone that rained from the skies further invigorated them. It was as if the great horned rat himself were filling his children with infernal vitality and energies. 
Soon, the Skaven would rise up as never before. The Council of Thirteen sat in oppressive silence. The chamber lay deep under the great temple of the Horned Rat, but was so imbued with entropic energies that it might as well have existed in a different realm. It was dark, lit only by a sickly green glow from the censers, and empty, save for a thirteen-sided pillar and a stone table. Both had runes scattered into them that pained the eye to look upon. Around the table sat the twelve rulers of the Under Empire. The thirteenth throne was empty, the symbolic seat save for the great horned rat. All was still, yet the air was filled with agitation. In the restless hush, a tail twitched. The hitching rasp of fluid-filled lungs identified the presence of Archplague Lord Nurglich, who sat upon the seat that is tenth, a simple throne of bone. Long had he awaited this hour. He savoured the strained silence, marking the passage of time by the whir of cogs and the hiss vent of steam from the rebreathing apparatus of Warlord Vrisk. Seer Lord Kritislik, who sat in the coveted first seat, both the suffocating quiet to address the Lords of Decay. Kritislik's thin voice crackled with rage, while the air surrounding him shimmered with undisguised power. I am displeased, yes, yes, Lord Mokskitter. I plague granted no leave to trade devices with lesser clans. Why was this claw pact broken with clan moors? For a moment, the most ancient of grey seers looked over his council members, his beady eyes examining each in turn. Lord Nurglich fought down the urge to shift, willing his roomy, pus-filled eyes not to blink unnaturally. Lord Morskitar, the most exalted warlord and master of Clan Skyri, shifted slightly, his telescopic eyes whirring as he fixed his attention upon the horned seer. Lord Nurglich knew, as did all the other council members, that Grittislick regularly banned the trade sale of weapons to clans that did not do the Grey Seer's bidding. Although Clan Skyri had sold their wares to a few of the banned clans, the general lack of advanced weaponry had made the invasion of Tylea much more costly for the Skaven. Without warp-fire throwers or gas grenades to exterminate pockets of resistance, many defenders had to be slain by tooth or spear. When Lord Morskitter finally answered Lord Kritislick, he did so in a metallic voice that echoed in that vast chamber. We have many, many machines for trade. Clan Moors offered the most warp tokens. Why should I not deal with Lord Nordwell? Why, why? Do I care if you think he has grown too powerful? The bulbous, mounded lump of muscle and sinew that was Lord Verminkin, the ultimate commander of Clan Mulder, nodded several of his heads in agreement. For a moment, silberland splutters escaped Chrysislick, making no glitches tail spasm in wicked delight. Airing private conversations amongst the council was a common way to undermine others. Indeed, it was Chrysislick's favorite tactic. This time, thought Nurglich, the roles were reversed. It was the Grey Seer's authority that was now being belittled. It was Lord Sneak who next broke the ominous silence. Nurglich and all the others turned their eyes to the shadow that was the ruler of Clan Eshin. Even when the sensor's light pulsed brightest, he remained obscured. Not for nothing was he named the Grand Night Lord. Say, Lord Grizzlick, I have withdrawn Deathmaster Snick from his target and informed Doomclaw of your double cross, said Lord Sneak in his whisper like voice. This was followed by a heavy thud as Cratch Doomclaw slammed the vast apparatus that had replaced his left arm onto the table. He was the Lord of Crookback Peak, supreme warlord of Clan Rictus, and he bared his yellowed fangs at Critislick in a challenge display. Again, Nurglich's tail quivered, for the sign was universally understood amongst Skaven from the lowest slave upwards. It was the posture of a common clan rat struck before openly fighting for rank. Critislick was incredulous, his curved horns glowing with a nimbus of power. You dare? I speak in the name of the great horned rat. I alone am. But before he could finish, his words turned to a screech, a wail of purest pain, 
as his body convulsed. Dark vapor issued from his distended jaws, a growing plume of blackness. The great pillar flashed, and from the cloud's midst, black lightning arced forth, convulsing inwardly upon himself. Critislick was reduced to a skeletal form in an instant, then burst into ash. Nurglitch was shocked, and the startled looks upon the other council members told him he was not alone. As the last flakes of the Grey Seer drifted downwards, the black cloud coalesced over the symbolic head of the council table. Beacon-like eyes blazed from out of the darkness. This was too much for Lord Nurglitch, who fell to the floor alongside the other Lords of Decay, prostrating himself in awe and terror. The horned rat had come. As he writhed upon the floor, unbidden knowledge filled Lord Nerglitch's head. In his mind, the Plague Lord saw visions of the malevolent shadow moon, swollen and huge it had grown. Then came the voice. It spoke in a discordant roar that was both a scratchy whisper and the screeching of a million million rats. Lord Nerglitch knew and understood. The great horned rat was displeased, no longer amused by his children's squabbles. A new seer lord would touch the pillar and join their council. He would rightfully speak in the horned rat's voice. Before departing, the horned rat spoke loud a single prophecy that threatened to reap apart the very fabric of reality. Children, we shall inherit. Cetra, the king of kings, did not slumber like the lesser potentates of his land, his innumerable vassals. He watched visionally over territory, studying the signs. Dark clouds of scavenger birds gathered over the sun-drenched deserts of Nehakara. The fell moon burned brightly, its sickly form forever waxing stronger. Strange storms rose up suddenly to wreak havoc, the demons from beyond the spirit realm once more stalked the lands, attacking in great numbers. Perhaps most perturbing of all to Cetra were the portents brought before him by a few priests of the mortuary cult. These liches, individuals who Cetra counted most loyal, spoke of strange whisperings that drifted upon the winds of Shaish, fervent beckonings that offered promises of power. With a command unprecedented in the chronicles of Nehekara's past, Cetra summoned his Hierophant and bade him wake all the kings, to rouse from slumber every legion. It had been many ages since even half their number had been stirred from deathless sleep. The only time in their history when all were awoken was during the War of Kings. Nagash's great ritual had sent dark magic coursing across the lands, invigorating the mummified and preserved kings of Nehekara and stirring up the charnel pits of the dead cities. Now, such was the looming threat descending upon Nehekara that Cetra would dare to risk the great king's strife again. Across the land of the dead, the mortuary priests lurched to their duties. Their bodies, having had to last far beyond any natural span, were hunched, bound too tightly by their wizened skin, Yet for all their shriveled and feeble appearance, they possessed a vitality working tirelessly, moving from tomb to tomb. They were the shepherds of the long sleep, the wakers of the dead. The sacred seals to tombs were broken, the age-old ritual incantations recited, the long monotonous drone begun, and then begun again. Once more the great cities of Nehekara began to stir and move. From out of the ruling city of Kemri rode Cetra's herald, Nekaf, and thousands of others. They brought messages from the King of Kings and sought counsel with those newly risen from their tombs. They bore scrolls assigning commands, sending forth patrols, tithing lesions to be sent elsewhere in the realm, and setting forth marching orders. The will of Cetra would not be denied. In the Charnel Valley, the Great Valley of the Kings, the necrotechs began to re-sculpt the eroded visages of the monarch's monumental statues. Beginning the long rituals, they would suffuse stone with the controlling spirits of the dead. At the bidding of Cetra himself, the master of their craft, Ramhotep the Visionary, 
marched along column of stone war statues to Kemri. There he was instructed to augment the wall of that greatest of cities, to build something no one had ever seen before. So did Ramhotep, with all his merciless drive, begin his greatest work yet. To the steady beat of the drums, the war fleet of Kemri rode up the great Mortis River. There it joined the Armada of Zandri, the fleet port of terror. The whole Mortis Delta was filled with fighting craft. In Liberus, the great relinquery of High Queen Calida was forbidden ground for the priests, but their rights were not required. Weeks before the mortuary cult received their message, the power of Asaf, the Asp Goddess, had awakened her champion with sibilant hissing. So it was that Calida, High Queen of Liberus, met the wizened priest from her throne. Her archer legions were formed up and ready as she welcomed the heralds to her city. Legion after legion marched across the blazing sands, taking up positions to repel invaders. Thousands of chariots sent up dust clouds to the heavens. Beneath the shifting sands, creatures buried themselves, ready to spring up in ambush at the first sign of intruders. From their burial pyramids, the lich priests also looked upon the latest portents and were deeply troubled. The world's great powers were moving, and there was a shifting in the winds of magic that carried with it tidings of war and change. War was nothing new, for the realm of the Tomb Kings was built upon a foundation of battles. Its unconquered legions were as strong and numerous as they had ever been. Indeed, in their pride and arrogance, most of the newly awakened kings were hawkish, embracing the onset of a great war. In battle, they saw a fresh chance to demonstrate their own superiority. Change, however, was not welcome in the land of the dead. Cetra's rule was known as the reign of a million years. The great king of Nehekara intended to see that it was so. Any who dared challenge his rule or his immortality would swiftly face his wrath. Kentika, lich priest and higher fat of Kimri, walked alone from the golden pillared chambers of the Palace of Monarchs. He came from the glorious presence of Setra the Imperishable, greatest of kings, ruler of Nehekara, and he bore a new decree for the mortuary cult. Hunched over, Kentika leaned upon his staff of office more heavily than usual, using it as a walking stick to aid his dragging gait. Kentika felt the great weight of years upon him as he never had before. The enormity of his task seemed fit to push him into the ground. Accompanied only by the echoing clicker-clatter of his staff and footsteps, Kentika made his way through the necropolis of kings to the burial pyramids. His mind was still in awe over his recent summons, the magnitude of his mandate and the dire situation it forebode. When his subordinates saw him, they halted their work, renewing the seals on the portals of the tombs. As one, the priests rose and began the ritual chants that were traditional when the Hierophant graced them with his presence. With a tap of his staff that sent shockwaves through the floor like the footfall of a striding colossus, Kentucker interrupted the droning priests. He held up his hand while the echoes of the gesture faded. There is no time. Abandon your tasks. We have other, more pressing ceremonies to perform said Kentika, to the silenced assembly. It was Nebamon, the bearer of the Staff of Ages, who first spoke the question. What did the Lord of the Four Horizons, the mighty Lion of the Infinite Desert, say? What has our King, the vanquisher of our enemies, asked of us, O revered one? With practice obedience, the cluster of hunched priests bowed low, awaiting the answer. Mighty Setra, Lord of the sky and earth, has ordered us to wake the kings and summon the legions once more, said Kentika. How many, O revered one, said Nebamon, after a respectful pause. All of them, said Kentika, as he turned to stride out of his tomb once more. Awaken them all. Far to the north of Nehekara's blazing sands, darkness lay upon Sylvania. 
The air was thick with apostatic enchantment, an unholy miasma that sapped the courage from even the most valorous soul and dissipated the cleansing energies of the faithful. Sylvania was now a land beyond the power of prayer. In the dungeons of Stenia State Castle, lately the chief stronghold of Manfred von Karstein, lay nine vessels of godly power, nine mortals teetering on the precipice of death, whose blood pulsed with the blessings of the divine. That blood was crucial to Manfred's plans. It was the foundation upon which his greatest design had been built. For centuries, the vampire had yearned to free Sylvania from the Empire's yoke, to transform it into an independent realm where darkness ruled and faith had no power. Now, the blood of the Nine had done its work. Walls of bone towered upon Sylvania's boundaries, transforming the Twilight Precinct into a sprawling fortress. This project had been the work of many mortal lifetimes, for the Nine had not been whimsically selected. Rather, their bloodlines had been identified by an enciphered prophecy buried in the Book of Nagash. Decrypting the code had taken Manfred decades, and for a long time his greatest fear had been that one or more of the bloodlines had withered. Fortunately, this proved not to be the case. Amongst the nine godly vessels were three great prizes. These individuals were nothing less than demigods, whose power lay but scantily concealed beneath a thin veil of flesh. Morgiana Le Fay had been the acquisition that Manfred had feared most, for historically his kind had met nothing save ruin in Bretonia. As matters transpired, she was the first to be enslaved, delivered into Manfred's clutches by Dreicha of Athel Lauren. The branch wraith gave no explanation for her deeds, and Manfred accepted the gift with but a token attempt to slay the giver. Aliathra, the ever-child of Othwan, was the next prey taken, whisked twice away from beneath the protection of her own people and the dwarves of Karazakarak. Last to fall, and symbolically most important, was Volkmar, Grand Theogenist of Sigmar, lured to Sylvania by pride and taken in battle during that arrogant invasion. It was Volkmar's blood that had completed the apostatic ritual, and transformed the very land he had sought to cleanse into the dark paradise it was now. Ultimately, though Manfred's design had been performed to perfection, not everything had unfolded as the Lord of Sylvania had intended. His realm had not been immune to the upheavals of recent months. Dark portals had appeared in those places where the dead had lain heaviest, spewing forth demons to spoil Sylvania's order and tranquility. Few such incursions had lasted long, for Zervania was not a squabbling mortal province, and its armies were easily roused to crush the invaders. More worryingly, Manfred had discovered that the humans of the Empire had soured his grand design. In preparation for his enchantment, Manfred had bidden his teeming packs of ghouls strip away Sylvanian temple, shrine, and burial ground of its holy symbols and bury them deep, so their sanctity would not trouble the undead. In the moment of Volkmar's capture, these icons had been plucked from the dank soul by a sorcerer's hand and set about Sylvania's bounds to form a cage of faith and light to tremel the dark. Neither Manfred nor any of his minions could cross that ring of holy light and step into the world beyond. Manfred deemed this imprisonment to be the work of Balthazar Gelt, patriarch of the Colleges of Magic, but it helped little to identify his tormentor. Gelt was in Altdorf, far beyond Manfred's reach thus his magics would have to be opposed instead. For long months, Manfred tried to overcome the wards set about his realm, but to no avail. The magic that Gelt had used to bind the holy symbols to Sylvania's border was proof against every counterspell and banishment that von Karstein could conjure. The Wall of Faith was an enchantment far subtler and more enduring than Manfred had come to expect from the crude minds of human wizards and the vampire quickly came to suspect that Gelt was not its true conceiver. With each failure, Manfred's mood grew blacker, the veneer of civilization he wore as a cloak becoming ever more tattered as his patience waned. Was he not the greatest of the von Karsteins, an heir to the power of Nagash? It was impossible, or so he was sure, for the pitiful sorceries of a mere human to countermand his own dread power. 
Yet, impossible or not, Gelt's war of faith withstood every attempt to see it unmade. The other vampires of Sylvania knew of Manfred's black mood and the cause, but there was little they could do to appease their master. Indeed, most soon forsook any attempt, especially since Manfred had personally flayed Thomas von Karstein for even daring to broach the subject of Gelt's enchantment. They were, for the most part, an unambitious get, most of those with a taste of aught beyond the domination of superstitious-ridden peasants had been eliminated long ago. Thus were they quite content with the situation as it stood. In time, perhaps, the ennui brought about by eternal life would drive the vampires of Sylvania to action, but, for the present, they saw no reason to court their master's wrath. Let the Lord Manfred lurk in Castle Sternest, poring over dusty tomes and parched scrolls, Sylvania was dark, night and day, and there were cruel pleasures without end to be slacked at whim. Chapter 1 An Accursed Alliance Autumn, year 2523, to summer, year 2524. As winter fell on the land of Sylvania, and portents of doom grew heavier in the skies above, Manfred von Karstein slowly became aware of an intruder in his realm. For some weeks now, the Lord of Sylvania's spies had whispered of a great battle fought on the edges of Bretonia, a battle in which an undead force led by Luan Leoncourt's bastard son, Malabord, had bloodied both the armies of his father and of Athel Loren. Malabard had been defeated, and many of the necromancers gathered to his cause, had fled over the mountains, drawn across the forests of the Empire and to the darkness of Sylvania. Most had lacked the wit to breach the walls of bone upon the border, but Manfred had quickly bound the survivors to his service. If nothing else, their arrival had taught the vampire one vital thing. Gelt's wall of faith worked only in one direction. It was genius that Manfred could appreciate under other circumstances, for it was the perfect combination of lure and trap, and the vampire was inclined to commend Gelt for his craft before tearing out his throat. Yet this newest intruder was not like the other vagabond necromancers who had entered Manfred's territory. He had made no move to announce his presence to the Lord of Sylvania, and did not attempt to offer fealty as others had. The vampire could taste a challenge on the air and move swiftly to meet it. After many weeks spent in fruitless attempts to unmake the Wall of Faith, he welcomed the distraction offered by a confrontation. Manfred journeyed swiftly south upon a steed of bone and black magic. He made no attempt to hide his approach. Now was not the time for subtlety, for it too easily could be taken for wariness or some other frailty of purpose. The Lord of Sylvania sent out wolves and bats to shadow the intruder's course but each time such minions came to within eyesight of their quarry, the vampire's hold over the creatures slipped away into nothing. Manfred was now close enough that he could sense the intruder's formidable willpower crowding in on his own. It had been many decades since he had last faced so worthy an adversary. A day later, Manfred and his foe met upon Valsborg Bridge. They came alone. Each deemed that to ride at the head of an army would be taken as a sign of weakness, and knew that the shadow graves of Sylvania would yield warriors enough if the need arose. The intruder waited at the centre of the bridge, his cowl twitching in the listless breeze. Rising high in the saddle, the Lord of Sylvania demanded that the intruder prostrate himself. The other did not move, but his dry laughter echoed across the fetid river. He had not come, the figure said, to bend his knee, but to reclaim relics that were his by right, a crown, a severed hand, and seven books of blood-inked flesh. Manfred knew those items well, indeed. He had drawn upon their power to bring eternal darkness to Sylvania, and he demanded why he should yield them. Nagash must rise, the figure intoned. He went on to remind the vampire that the Lord of the Undead was not ungenerous to those who served him loyally and well, 
there was a place to be claimed at his side, if the vampire was but bold enough to claim it. In that moment, Manfred knew who it was he faced, for none other than Arkan the Black, first of the Nine Dark Lords, would have had the audacity to undertake such a mission. Manfred now suspected the path the future would take, and it was little to his liking. He sought to extend the darkness or Sylvania to every corner of the world, but what reason was there for such a venture if another ruled that paradise in his stead? It could not be permitted. With a cry, the vampire smote the lich with a bolt of writhing shadow, yet when the skeins of darkness cleared, Arkan still stood, and his hollow laughter echoed across the river once more. Thus did the Valsborg Bridge become the site of a sorcerous duel of grand proportions. For hours, the vampire and the lich battered each other with spell and counterspell, each striving for a weakness in the other's defenses. The clinging black sod of the river meadows heaved as the unquiet dead were summoned forth to do the bidding of one dark master or the other. Evenly matched though they might have been on neutral ground, this was Sylvania, and here Manfred was the master or so it seemed. Though Arkan hammered at the vampire's defences, he could not breach them, and was sorely pressed to counter Manfred's own spells. The mouldering warriors who fought in the cloying mud were well matched in number, but Manfred called black wolves from the distant tree line and bats from the gloom-laden sky, and these tore into Arkan's corpse puppets with fang and claw. Arkan channeled more magic into his ailing minions, but his own defences were crumbling, Seeing his foe founder, Manfred let out a mighty cry of victory and began to intone the guttural syllables of another spell. Without warning, a shaft of sunlight burst from the clouds high above and struck the bridge between the vampire and the lich. At once, Manfred realized that victory would bring him nothing but disaster. In his drive to vanquish his foe, the vampire had unconsciously drawn upon the same magics that sustained Sylvania's enchantments if he continued on this course, the work of decades would be undone. But if he did not, would he have power enough to best Arkan? Manfred let the energies of his murderous spell dissipate and dismissed his risen legions with a wave of his hand. As the dark skies billowed to choke away the rays of sunlight, the Lord of Sylvania struck a truce with Arkan the Black. If victory this day concealed disaster tomorrow, or so the vampire reckoned, Perhaps a false defeat might yet offer up a bounteous future. Nagash was a being of great power, but Manfred had spent centuries learning how to harness power to his will. This would be no different. Arkan saw clearly what was in Manfred's mind, but agreed to the truth all the same. Let the Lord of Sylvania think himself the master here. The Lich knew better. The vampire, like all his line, was but a by-blow of an ancient and glorious dynasty. He did not know what true power was, but he would soon enough. Manfred regarded Arkan impassively as the Lich spoke of dire fates and of his dread master's return. The vampire still regretted his brief display of fear when the shaft of light had hit the bridge and he was determined not to lose further face. He just wished the intruder would come to the point. How he hated the desiccated creature before him. Arkan's history was one of defeat and groveling servitude. Now he came to Sylvania demanding to be treated as a conquering lord, or even as an equal? Ha! It was unthinkable. It was beyond arrogant. You have read the signs as clearly as I, the lich's voice droned on. The growing power of chaos makes no distinction between the living and the dead. Nagash must rise, or our realm of silence will fall, and yours will be the first. Manfred marked the unsubtle threat, but remained unmoved. He had no intention of serving Nagash. He had not plotted the demise of his own bloodline, only to bend his knee to a long-withered necromancer, whose legend held more power than his body ever had. If the choice lay between oblivion at the hands of the Dark Gods and eternal servitude in Nagash, then he would reluctantly choose the former. And yet... And yet there was opportunity in what the Lich proposed. 
Manfred knew the ritual that Arkan intended to use, and knew also the ways in which it could be subverted to another cause. Yes, he thought. The opportunity was worth the risk. Very well, Manfred said at last. We have a pact, at least for now. Come, we will discuss the matter further. Did the vampire know how transparent his thoughts were? Arkan considered Manfred's palpable arrogance as he followed him from the bridge. The ancient granite of its stone still bore the signs of their duel, a contest Arkan had carefully gauged to learn the true extent of his opponent's power. The lich acknowledged no rivals when it came to the mastery of the dark arts, but he had found Manfred's ability worryingly impressive all the same. The vampire would make a dangerous foe, and an even more dangerous ally. Arkan was no fool. He knew that Manfred would never trust him, but that was the smallest of burdens. He had not come to Sylvania in search of an ally, but out of need for a cat's paw. Matters were coming to a head, and he alone could not achieve all that needed to be done. Nagash's voice had whispered in the Lich's mind for centuries, but it had never spoken with urgency it did now. Chaos was rising, and time was growing short. Let Manfred think that he was the master, thought Arkan. The vampires had always been prideful and wayward. They had no concept of loyalty and lived only for their own capricious pleasures. This one was the worst of a particularly rebellious bloodline, his desires often gorged but never sated. Whether the vampire realized it or not, he would be Arkan's puppet from this moment on, and it would surely be little consolation to Manfred that his strings had been woven from his own upstart ambitions. Nagash would rise, Arkan swore, and Manfred, willing or not, would play his part. When the reluctant allies arrived at the bleak towers of Castle Seneste, many of Manfred's inner circle were somewhat surprised to see how accommodating their master was to his unwelcoming guest. But the keener witted of them soon realized the truth of the matter. Manfred afforded Arkan every courtesy, because he knew well that the line between ally and enemy was vanishingly thin and could be crossed as a consequence of the smallest act. The more Manfred dwelled upon the idea of raising Nagash and breaking the supreme necromancer to his will, the more he yearned for the immense power that outcome would bring. Arkan would be a necessary trial in the meantime, and the Lord of Sylvania had no wish to jeopardize his cooperation. In any event, the Lich bore watching. Proud and manipulative as Manfred was, he knew Arkan to be a creature far older and craftier than himself. Wisdom dictated that the Lord of Sylvania remain alert for treachery. Thus, in those fleeting moments where Manfred was not at his guest's side, there were always bats or thrall spirits through whom the vampire kept a careful watch. Arkan made no attempt to blind these spies. He too needed his allies' cooperation and, for the time being, was content to let the vampire play his games. At no time did Arkan make any attempt, nor any suggestion of intent, to remove the relics from Stanesti's dungeons. The items would be needed to restore Gnagash, or so the lich declared, and in the meantime, he could think of no better use for them than ensuring Sylvania remained a land beyond the grasp of meddling mortals. He did, however, ask to see the relics, and after some consideration, Manfred led him into the dank depths of the castle. Nine prisoners were held in chains about the walls, each shackled to a great lectern of dark iron. Seven of the lecterns held treasures Arkand had journeyed far to seek, the missing books of Nagash. Long had it been since so many of these blighted tomes had been gathered together, and the dank air of the chamber resonated with their barely contained power. A jagged crown sat in the very centre of the room, its gemstones glittering darkly even though there was little light for them to reflect. This was the infamous crown of sorcery, rescued at last from the vaults of Altdorf, waiting only for its rightful master to claim it. On the floor around the crown ran a series of deep grooves, 
These were inlaid with rich gold that was almost invisible beneath the blood that pulsed and flowed over it. There was no obvious pattern to these scarlet lines, no pleasing symmetry nor artistry of design. It was only from a distance that a watcher could see the true shape they described. This was a cartograph of Sylvania's boundaries. It was a foundation upon which Manfred's apostatic enchantment had been built, and its channels were fed by trickling rivulets of the captive's holy blood. These captives were broken and beaten, their flesh mangled by their jailer's cruel attentions. Some had been crippled by wounds taken in battle or inflicted by torture. All hovered on the brink of death, kept in the living world by their captor's sorcerous artifice rather than out of any desire to remain alive. Only two were awake. One was an old man, his armored robes of office crusted with his own blood and his bald head marred by a livid wound that wept red tears onto his face. His eyes were clouded with pain, but still glared defiantly at the monsters who held him prisoner. The other wakeful captive was an elf, her once radiant blonde hair matted with blood and filth, a silver tiara hanging askew amidst her tangled braids. Her eyes were closed, and her lips worked constantly, suggesting a mind in the grip of madness. The Vargeist that watched over the dungeons knew Arkan for an outsider as soon as his bloodless scent reached their nostrils. The creatures retreated to the shadows at Manfred's command, but hissed and snarled as the lich ran his fleshless fingers reverently across each of the relics in turn. Arkham paid them no heed. He had borne the final two books of Nagash with him on his journey, and these he now placed upon the empty lecterns. As he picked his way across the blood-stained floor, Arkan's empty eye socket alighted on the nine whose sainted blood fed the ritual, lingering perhaps a moment on the elven ever-child's slender brow. Much of what would be required was already assembled, he judged, and that which remained could be claimed with ease. Three more relics were essential, three relics tied to the Lord of the Undead's demise. All lay within reach of Sylvania, all were ripe for the taking. Of greater concern was the holy barrier around Sylvania. Whilst it remained in place, any expedition beyond the realm of darkness was impossible. For this, however, Arkan had a solution, albeit a costly one. There was, he said, a long-forgotten ritual that could make a small breach in the Wall of Faith, but it required holy blood. One of Manfred's prisoners would have to be sacrificed. The Lord of Sylvania disliked this news, but saw the necessity of the sacrifice. The rewards had the potential to outweigh all of the risks. By the time Arkan's preparations were complete, Manfred had gathered an army on the western border of Sylvania, the Drakenhof banner twitching fitfully above silent ranks. In the middle distance lay Gelt's Wall of Faith, the symbols of Moor, Sigmar, Ulrich, and a dozen other guards suspended in midair and glowing with holy light. At the side of the roadway, Arkan stood within a ritual circle. At his feet, pinioned by stakes driven through flesh, lay his offering, Lupio Blaze, a knight of the blazing sun. His blood was not the strongest of the nine, but it was powerful enough. Black candles, their tallow rendered from human flesh, gutted in the wind, whipping around him as the lich intoned words not heard since the days of al -Kadizar. As his chant grew louder, thunder rolled overhead and black lightning split the skies. Wisps of dark mist spiraled madly about Arkan's outstretched arms. Wolves howled in the distance, and the bitter air grew thick with roiling power. With a triumphant cry, Arkan took a bone dagger from his robes, and slit Lupio's veins at the wrist and thigh. As the last of the knight's blood pulsed onto the ground, the lich clenched together the fingers of his empty hand, and the candles toppled inward, setting light to the body. Of everything within the circle, only Arkan was untouched by the flames. Once their fury had been expended, he beckoned for the Drakenhof banner to be brought forward. The lich anointed the von Karstein's ancestral standard with the ashes at his feet, and bade their bearer approach the Wall of Faith. 
as the Drakenhof banner approached the barrier. The nearest of the shining symbols grew dull and dark. The way ahead was open, and the hunt could begin. Once beyond the borders of Sylvania, Manfred and Arken elected to divide their forces, at least for the moment. It was only a matter of time before their travail drew the attention of meddlesome eyes, and the more swiftly they could gather the last relics, the greater the chance of ultimate success. It was agreed that Arken would travel far to the west, to the lands of Bretonia. It was there that Alakanash, Nagash's fabled staff of power, lay sealed within the holy vault of La Mazantal Abbey. Arken saw this little challenge in his charge. His support of Malabar's uprising had been only partially successful, but it had left the once mighty kingdom in poor shape to oppose him a second time, especially in the south where his quest now took him. Arken sought to journey alone, his plan to gather forces nearer to his goal, but Manfred insisted that the lich accept a bodyguard of Drakenhof Templars to ensure that he reached his destination without incident, or, at least, without incident not to Manfred's design. If Arken resented this insistence, he gave no sign. He was well aware that the vampire would likely attempt to depose him once the work was done, but had drawn plans against such an eventuality. Manfred's course would take him further south, to Mad Dog Pass and the lair of Clan Mordkin. These Skaven had once masterminded the downfall of Nagash, and it was a weapon that they had created for that task that Manfred sought to recover. Known to darkest legend as the Fell Blade, the sword that had been the tool by which al Khadizar, Nagash's bitterest foe, had once destroyed the Lord of the Undead. Akadizar had died soon after, overcome by the Fellblade's baleful magic, and Clan Mordkin had recovered the weapon. Yet the power of the Fellblade was greater than even the Skaven knew, for though Nagash had returned several times since his destruction at Alcadizar's hands, the Fellblade's curse ensured that each manifestation was weaker than the one that had come before it. So dire had this state of affairs become, that the final time Nagash had walked to the living world, on the so-called Night of the Restless Dead, his spirit had dispersed before dawn on the next day. For Nagash to live once more, the fell blade's vile enchantments would have to be broken forever. Only when Alkanash and the fell blade had been recovered would Arkan and Manfred join forces once more, for the final relic would likely prove the hardest to reclaim. This was Morakain, the Black Armor of Nagash. It had been taken as a trophy during Sigmar's defeat of the Lord of the Undead by warriors who had fought at the Heldenhammer's side. Many centuries had passed since those days, but the spiritual descendants of those warriors still held Morricane and guarded it as closely as they did their forebears' honor. Now the black armor lay at the heart of Heldenheim, a sprawling chapter keep closely guarded by the Knights of Sigmar's blood. Heldenheim lay on the border between the imperial provinces of Stirland and Avaland, and any assault there would quickly reveal that the denizens of Sylvania were not so contained as the rulers of the empire believed. That ignorance had to be maintained as long as possible, lest the humans take it upon themselves to besiege Sylvania once again. Aliathra's eyes opened with a start as the vampire seized her jaw. It was a purely instinctive response, for she had been all but blind for many months now. She felt his talons sink into her flesh, but there was no pain. There hadn't been any pain for weeks, not since her veins had been opened to fuel the cartograph. Was she even alive any longer? The other child did not know. Still alive. Good. The vampire's voice was polite, even cultured, but Aliathra wasn't fooled. She had been his unwilling guest too long, had experienced firsthand the creature's endless capacity for cruelty. It appears that you are even more important to me than I had previously believed. My people are coming for me. When they arrive, you will burn, Aliathra hissed, and took satisfaction from the flicker of concern that crossed the vampire's face. Despite his arrogance, the creature still feared the power of the elves, as well he should. Indeed, my dear, the creature mocked, 
his momentary weakness gone, as if it had never existed. Then I shall break them again, as I broke them beneath Nagishazar. But don't concern yourself. Nothing will go to waste. The words were a distraction, a feint, as they had been so many times before. Eleathra tried to turn away, but the vampire held her fast, his inky black eyes boring into hers. She could feel the pressure of his will as he sought to probe her mind. She knew that he could sense something amiss, that the supposedly enthralled captive still kept a secret from him. Each time the vampire took a better measure of her defences, and each time the struggle to resist grew harder. What are you hiding? the vampire demanded. Twisting Aliathra's head viciously, his eyes tracing the contours of her skull, as though seeking some physical imperfection that might aid his interrogation. Aliathra gave no answer. The pressure grew stronger, and she could feel her will crumbling. The desire to surrender was overpowering. Despite the Everchild's defiant words, she had no certainty of rescue. She had spun her silent song every moment of these terrible months, a call so subtle that even the vampire's finely attuned senses could not hear it. Alas, it had gone unanswered. For all Ariathra knew, she had been abandoned. Only a desperate hope remained, and hope was hard to maintain in Sylvania. Why not yield and end the pain? Suggested a whisper in Ariathra's mind, and she could not tell if the thought was her own or her captor's. The child was on the brink of submitting when another voice sounded in the dungeon. It was as dry as the distant desert, and it took no effort to disguise its disparaging tone. Captivating though it is to watch the great Manfred von Karstein demonstrate his mastery over a shackled mortal, we have other business, and little time in which to accomplish it. The vampire's attention wavered only for a moment, but it was enough. Eliathra rallied and rebuilt her defenses stronger and thicker than before. The vampire sensed the renewed defiance and, snarling in frustration, he abandoned the questioning of his prisoner and stalked back to the shadows that crowded on the Everchild's sight. With a brief prayer to Isha, Eliathra closed her eyes and began the silent song anew. Arkan did not head directly to his prize after parting with Manfred, for he knew that he would need more than the mindless dead at his command if he were to meet with success. Thus his path took him into the foothills of the mountain range known as the Vault. There he rebound to his service the self-titled Lichmaster Heinrich Kemmler and the ancient white Krell. These two had served Arkan well during Malobard's rebellion, reinforcing the renegade prince's army of brigands and traitors with legions of unquiet dead. Krell's loyalty was without question, for he was as driven as Arkan to see Nagash restored, but Kemler was a different matter entirely. The Lich Master loathed indenturement to any master, and Arkan knew he would follow only whilst it suited his own interests. The three travelled deeper into the vaults, seeking out the web-strewn tombs that lined the mountainside. Great battles had been fought there in ages past, and the selfish spirits of the slain rested uneasily in their mausoleums. Arkan and Kemler broke their elf-set seals and roused the spiteful dead to their cause. It was yet a small army, but one with a potency that far outreached its slender numbers. And besides, there would be corpses enough in Britonia to swell the ranks. Arkan's march north was not a thing of subtlety, but tore straight through the already ravaged hearts of Carcassonne and Brion. These once great provinces had been reduced to a desolation by rebellion and plague. For every village that yet struggled to scratch a living from the soil, another two or three were corpse-choked charnels. Castles stood empty on hillsides, and in vales, manors were fire-blackened ruins. Arkan marched through them all, the unburied dead stirred into life in his wake. The Lich had never truly believed that Malobord had possessed the will to seize his father's crown, but had given the traitor every support nonetheless. 
In this, he had been driven partly by a malicious desire to see exactly how Malabord would fail, but chiefly because he knew that Bretonia would be greatly weakened, no matter the victor. Now Arkin looked upon the grim results of his manipulations, but felt no satisfaction. Events had simply unfolded as he had foreseen. Despite Bretonia's dolorous state, Arkin's advance did not go entirely unchallenged by her defenders, but only one such encounter could have even been considered a battle. Duke Tancred of Quenelles, the second of his line to bear that name, met Arkin in battle as the undead host crossed the border into Brionne. Tancred and his knights were amongst the last survivors of, of ravaged Quenelles, battle-scarred veterans of the Civil War that had seen their beautiful city toppled into the mud. They struck at Arkin's army in a lance of brilliant blue and silver, striving as men possessed as they sought to win victory in the lady's name. For Tancred, this was a battle of honour. Revenge blinded him to the true scale of the undead force and goaded him on ever deeper into a sea of bone and rotting flesh. For Arkin, this battle was an inconvenience. Not wishing to be troubled with its prosecution himself, he commanded the Lichmaster to end the Duke's struggles. This Kemler did with malicious glee, for Tancred's line had been a thorn in his aged hide for many years. Tancred perished that day, his flesh withered by the Lichmaster's sorceries and his spine split by Krell's axe. With the Duke's death, those knights who yet lived turned their steeds to the east and fled for the comparative safety of Castle Brenache one of the last remaining strongholds in Western Quenelles. With the loss of Duke Tancred II, the duties and privileges of the baronetcy of Quenelles fell to a distant cousin. Gerard, Palatine of Assaro, had fought at Tancred's side during the Duke's last ride. Alas, at the battle's height, his seed had been struck with terror and borne him far afield. By the time Gerard had mastered the beast once more, Tancred had been slain and his knights scattered. Gerard's blood boiled with the need for revenge. He prayed for guidance and sought counsel of Lady Elinis, the Dowager of Charnot, and a prophetess of great renown. Though Elinis agreed to lend her aid, the scrying was a troublesome affair. The waters of the future had been befouled by demons, and the lady's voice drowned out by the laughter of the Chaos Guards. For three days, Lady Elinès took no food and teetered on the precipice of madness. Then, at last, the lady appeared in the prophetess's fevered dreams and revealed that the unliving were marching on La Mazental Abbey. With the undead legion's destination at last known, Gerard gathered what knights he could and rode north with all haste. This was not the first time La Mazental had been threatened. Within its vaults lay a trove of ancient relics of origins both fair and foul, and over the centuries, many attackers had sought to pluck these artifacts from their rightful resting place. After the last major battle some thirty years earlier, Duke Tancred I had financed an ambitious series of fortifications about the Abbey. It had been his intentions to render Le Maisontal into a fortress as mighty as any in Bretonia. However, Following the Duke's death at the Battle of Montford Bridge, corruption and apathy stripped the works of any momentum, and the barely begun wars had soon been stripped by peasants. Nonetheless, Tancred's efforts had not been entirely fruitless. Garrison quarters had been completed before work upon the walls had even begun, and these now housed a force of many hundreds of archers and men-at-arms, as well as scores of knights drawn from all fourteen provinces. Though the peasants had little inkling as to the honour bestowed by service at La Maisontal, the nobility considered it amongst the highest of callings. Most determined of all was Duke Theodric of Brionne, who had come to La Maisontal out of penance for a chain of unchivalric deeds. Under his leadership, the garrison of La Maisontal were more active than it had ever been, maintaining patrols and watch posts deep into the surrounding countryside. Thus protected, La Maisontale had ridden out the tide of slaughter that engulfed the land south of the river Vismeri. The irony was, of course, that in its earliest days, 
the campaign against Malobord had swung back and forth on the slenderest of numbers, and had Theodric led his garrison to join the king's army, the traitor's threat could have been ended all the sooner. Cornell's and Carcassonne would not have fallen, and Brion and Aquitaine would not lay in ruins. As it was, Theodric had sought absolution so desperately that it had blinded him to all else. He had remained as La Maison Tau's guardian, even whilst his ancestral lands had burned. Now it seemed that Theodric's ardour would be the salvation of Les Maison Tal. He was a man of fire with purpose. Before him was his moment of redemption, a chance to atone for his weakness of mind and body. What better way for a true knight to prove himself anew than in battle against a vile undead? Scorning Gerard's advice, Theodric ordered the garrison to muster in the meadow south of the abbey. That, he declared to all who would listen, was where they would win a great victory for the lady, and prove to all Bretonia that hope had not yet forsaken the realm. The twelfth battle of Les Marsontal was about to begin. Upon leaving Sylvania, Manfred von Karstein's course diverged from Ark and the Blacks almost immediately. With him he carried the claw of Nagash. Long ago, the fell blade had severed this withered hand from its master. Magic still tethered the two relics together, and it was this bond that guided Manfred's steps. The vampire's course lay across the southern states of the Empire, and through fractured provinces of the border princes. The Lord of Sylvania did not travel alone, but marched to the head of a column of knights. It might have suited the Lich to scrabble his way across the living lands like a beggar, but Manfred was determined to travel as befitted his station. Appearances would be maintained. Most of those who rode with Manfred were whites, roused from their sepulchres to accompany their lord in distant lands, but the riders who clustered closest beneath the Drakenhof banner were the Templars of Manfred's personal guard. Each had been raised to darkness by Manfred himself, and was as loyal to his master as it was possible for a vampire to be. Yet for all his arrogance, Manfred was no fool. It suited his vanity to play the indomitable liege, but he was wary of the imperial chattel still. Their tenacity had surprised him too many times for it to be otherwise. The Lord of Sylvania knew that no other could defend his land so well as he, and determined that no one in the Empire, not even the dullest peasant, would mark his departure in case it could be exploited. He used magic to shroud his army's passage where he could. If battle was necessary, he struck hard and fast, using every merciless artifice learned in a lifetime of war. Normally, Manfred strove to leave survivors in the aftermath of his attacks, heralds of his dread majesty, whose tales of terror would weaken the resolve of all who heard them. Not this time. This time, patrols went missing and entire villages vanished overnight, with nary a witness as to what had occurred. The counts and dukes of the southern states reacted to these disappearances slowly. This was not out of any laxness on their part, but a lack of resource. The portents of doom Manfred had espied from Castle Steneste had not gone unmarked by the citizens of the Empire, and many regions now teetered on the brink of riot. Between containing the panic of their own people and curtailing the increasingly bold raids of the Beastmen, the rulers of Wizenland and Avaland had few troops to spare to investigate isolated incidents far from their capitals and trade routes. Thus did Manfred's army cross into the border princes unmarked by all save the dead he left in his wake. Manfred had worried little about crossing the border princes. He had travelled widely through its provinces some years before, and had found the so-called realm to be little more than a collection of fractious and inbred nobles ever at war with one another. Allegiances and loyalty were famously for sale here, and gold won more battles than steel ever had. There were few standing armies in the border princes. Instead, most of the dukes employed mercenary bands, who sold their services to the highest bidder. Not all such sell swords were entirely human. Manfred knew of at least two mercenary armies whose ranks contained naught but the walking dead, 
and he thus doubted that his own force would provoke the same martial response they would have within the bounds of the Empire. The very worst that could happen was that he would have to masquerade as a sellsword captain himself. It would be an inglorious and chafing deception, but the Lord of Sylvania had little desire to fight his way through the border princes in order to see his mission done. However, as Manfred descended through Havargir Forest, he realized his plans would have to be revised. The plains and Fenland before him should have been dotted with proud cities and fortified outposts, the gaudy devices of nobles and captains fluttering upon the pennants. What the vampire beheld instead was a land in utter ruin. Castles were scorched piles of toppled stone, towns were smoldering embers choked with unburied corpses, and everywhere the signs of plague lay heavy on the land. The architects of this destruction revealed themselves before dusk on that day, a warband of Skaven, fresh from plundering the lands further west and invigorated by their accomplishments, scurried eastward across the blighted plains. The Skaven warlord had met with much success in recent days, and his swarm now travelled back to their burrows with the spoils of war. Trinkets and gewgaws of all kinds, as well as the hundreds of filthy humans they had taken as slaves. Buoyed to false confidence, the warlord mistook Manfred's banner for that of another border princeling, and drove his verminous kin to the attack. It soon proved to be a, a calamitous mistake. Once the slaughter was done, Manfred walked amongst the dead, raising their blighted spirits long enough to question them. He found it a most trying exercise. This was not because the act of necromancy itself was draining, on the contrary, it was amongst the most basic of conjurings in the vampire's repertoire. Rather, it was because the souls of the Skaven remained as deceitful in death as they had been in life. Only by framing questions precisely could Manfred extract the information he sought. The process of doing so quickly sapped the vampire's never-abundant patience, and he tore more Skaven spirits to ghostly shreds in the battle's aftermath than he had seen living ratmen at its height. Fortunately, there was no shortage of dead Skaven to interrogate, and Manfred at last gleaned enough information to understand what had befallen the border princes. The Skaven were rising. Tylea had already fallen, and both Estalia and the border princes were now assailed. Manfred found this news troubling, for he had never known the Ratmen to possess singular purpose enough to bring low an entire realm let alone two or three. Arkan the Black had been correct. Dire times were afoot. Resolving to tarry no longer, Manfred rode with all possible haste. His last action before doing so was to set loose the terrified slaves. He did this not out of compassion. No trace of any such emotion lurked in the vampire's black heart, but because they would doubtless prove a valuable distraction for the Skaven. If the Rat Men were unified and in de facto control of the Board of Princes, such distractions would be worth a great deal indeed. For days, Manfred headed further south and east, drawn onwards by the call of the Claw. The vampire could feel the strength of the bond growing with every step, but still the prize lay out of reach. Scarcely a league passed beneath the hooves of Manfred's steed without another contest with the Skaven. Most were mere raiding parties, quickly broken beneath the lances of the Sylvanian knights. But as he crossed Skull River, Manfred found himself drawn into battle with a swarm so great that its squealing bodies and ramshackle war engines spanned the horizon. What followed was the closest battle of Manfred's march so far, and prevailed only by raising the dead of three ravaged fortress towns to bolster his ranks. As the waters of the rivers washed away the Skaven dead, the Lord of Sylvania realized that speed alone could no longer serve. By the time Manfred reached the entrance to Mad Dog Pass, thousands of rotting corpses and tormented spirits followed in his wake. The Iron Claw orcs tried to bar the vampire's entry to the pass, but they fared no better than had the Skaven. The call of the Claw was stronger than ever before, the fell blade so close that the Lord of Sylvania could sense the dark magics of its creation. On it led him, luring him into the ancient tunnels buried deep beneath Mad Dog Pass. The Battle of Mordkin Lair Manfred von Karstein would never remember the slaughter beneath Mad Dog Pass 
as one of his finest battles. Indeed, once the matter was ended, he didn't even consider it a battle at all. The Lord of Sylvania was a proud creature, and ordinarily, his every act was a continuance of some greater plan. However, there was room for neither subtlety nor cleverness waiting for him beneath Mad Dog Pass, just a press of bodies and a savage battle of attrition. Still, Manfred had done what he could to ensure some semblance of control. He had known that the Skaven tunnels would be deep and labyrinthine, and he determined not to commit his best troops until he had more complete knowledge of what awaited him. Instead, he wheeled wave upon wave of zombies into the dank and filthy reaches. His main goal was to use the eyes of his puppets in place of his own, to map out a path his Drakenhof Templars could follow through the festering pit. If the zombies stained the swarms of ratmen in the process, then so much the better. The deeper Manfred's army descended, the grander the scale of the tunnels grew. This was a place unnamed by the realms of the sunlit world, gnarled long ago from the roots of the mountains by the ratmen of Clan Mordkin. Unspeakable poisons dripped from filth-encrusted stalactites, and the rough walls were marked by untold generations of crude scrawl or hidden beneath ramshackle structures of warped wood and tarnished brass. A scaven resistance to the encroaching undead was sporadic at first. The upper tunnels were home only to chieftains so far out of favor with warlord Feskit that they had been forced to nest on the periphery of Clan Wardkin's territory. Such ratmen had little to gain by risking their own lives on Festkin's behalf. Most drove their poor warriors from the invader's path, craftily preserving their strength and hoping that unfolding events would weaken Feskit sufficiently that a challenge could be made. In others, ambition burned so brightly that they sought confrontation directly to recoup their lost status by proving their value to the lair. Whatever their motivations, few of these chieftains realized the scope of the invasion. Most blundered headlong into tunnels already thick with mindless dead. Soon the upper tunnels were cacophonous with the desperate squealing of Skaven with nowhere to run. In the deepest part of the burrow, nestled against the black corner of a great vaulted cavern, stood Clan Mordkin's fortress lair. It was a ramshackle and mismatched thing, built from material scavenged and stolen from many lands. Its towers, though canted over at worrying angles, reached almost to a stalactite-encrusted ceiling, and its walls bristled with all manner of warp-fired weaponry. Deep within the fortress lair, Lord Feskid heard death shrieks echo down from the tunnels above and knew his realm was beset. He did not despair then, nor when the first trickle of survivors began spreading tales of vampires stalking through the darkness. True, the upper tunnels were almost certainly lost, but he still had many thousands of teeming clan rats to unleash. Raising himself from his battered seat of power, actually a dwarven throne plundered from the hold of Karak Khan, Feskit began issuing imperious orders to his slaves. Some he said to fetch his armor and weapons from his scavenge pile, Others he sent as messengers to his mostly loyal chieftains, calling them to battle with promises of preferment and plunder. The warlord did not know what had brought Manfred into his domain, nor did he particularly care. His thoughts lay only on the opportunity for profit. A vampire's ashes would fetch a high price on the undermarket, and he intended to claim that wealth for his own. As the undead forced their way deeper, Clan Mordkin made their first concerted counterattack. A discordant clamor of bells echoed through the caverns, and the bone gates of the fortress lair swung open. The gates themselves were a trophy of one of Clan Mordkin's greatest successes, the slaughter of Ithragar the Fireworm. Snared by shock nets, poisoned, chained, and dragged beneath the surface, the dragon had been kept stupefied for weeks. Many litters had grown strong on its flesh before the mighty beast's life had finally given out. As the immense ribcage split apart, hordes of clan rats and storm vermin issued out of the fortress lair and into the tunnels. This attack was not led by Feskid, who saw no reason to risk himself so early in what promised to be a long and dangerous battle, but by Snickrat, a chieftain of middling rank. Snickrat had his own designs upon Feskid's throne, 
but thought the warlord ignorant of his ambitions. Accordingly, he misconstrued the undertaking as an opportunity for his own advancement, when in fact it was actually Feskit seeking to rid himself of a challenger. As Snickrat swarms advanced to meet the oncoming tide of dead, Clan Mordkin's lower tunnels began the feeding lines and waste pipes of a gigantic and soulless machine, whose only function was to grind flesh and bone into lifeless spoil. In places, this was the literal truth. Cogs, corroded pistons, and acid-pitted flywheels projected into the passageways and caverns at all angles. These scaven-made mechanisms were of vast scale and always in motion, their incredible mass driven by convulsing warp reactors deep within the lair. Surrounded as they were by this press of machinery, it was often impossible for the combatants to form lines greater than five or six abreast, and even then, a single misstep could see a warrior whisked into some clanking mechanism and pulverized. Yet the living and the undead had their parts to play as well. Their weapons were the blades of the machine, their blood and ichor, the oil that lubricated its workings. The zombies, driven onwards by Manfred von Karstein's implacable will, marched blindly into the spears and swords leveled against them, their rotten fingers reaching for skaven throats and eyes, even as their bodies were sliced apart. The Skaven were scarcely less determined, fighting as small groups on territory not their own. They are cowardly and opportunistic fighters, but when a clan is forced to defend its lair, the Ratmen fight like the cornered beasts they are. And so it was now. Skaven hacked at the zombies with halberd and spear, and when the fighting was too close for blade work, or when the weapons were plucked from their grasp, they tore at the enemy with claws and chiseled teeth. Rats surged out of the depths, and swarmed over the undead in a maddening frenzy, burrowing deep into decaying torsos and devouring them from inside out. Yet no matter how desperately they strove, no skaven could match a vampire thrall to minion for sheer, uncaring relentlessness. Little by little, the ratmen were driven back. Snickrat now ordered warp fire throwers forward. At his shrieking command, the scryree forged weapons belched green flame into the tunnels, the fire raged indiscriminately, incinerating clan rats and zombie alike. Rats flooded out of the passageways, squealing madly as they sought to escape the flames. Still, the undead came on, striding remorselessly through passages and chambers strewn with flame-twisted dead. Some were still ablaze as they advanced, their flesh crackling and popping as the warp fire tore through them. Again, Snickrat ordered the fires unleashed, and again, the green flames whooshed through the tunnels. But still, the undead came on, blazing like torches. Snekrat realized that the tunnels were lost, and fled deeper into the lair. He gave no order to retreat, but clan rats flooded after him nonetheless. The rat men could smell defeat upon the air, and tore at one another as they fled, abandoning the weak and the slow to the merciless dead. As the skaven retreated, Timber props, weakened by the gushing warp fame, gave way. Many tunnels collapsed entirely, sealing the living and the dead together in rocky tombs. The fighting now drew nigh to the last defense, a bottomless cavern that split the outer tunnels from the great cavern that was the very heart of Clan Mordkin's lair. This chasm was spanned by a long and winding bridge of sorts, a broad and uneven roadway of planks, spars, tar-clogged ropes, and other detritus. It was not a structure of which any dwarf or human would have approved, or even have trusted to bear their weight, for it was entirely too rickety, but it served the Skaven well enough. There was no other way to cross the chasm, not for a league in any direction, for Clan Mordkin had long ago undermined all other routes, the better to prevent infiltration or attack by rival clans. As Snickrat fled across the bridge, he ordered its ramshackle timbers set alight. The flames took reluctantly at first, for the wood was thick with slime and refuse, but the searing warp fire would not be denied. Soon the entire span was ablaze. As the vanguard of Manfred's shambling hordes reached the center of the bridge, the tortured structure groaned, shifted, and then, with a grace utterly alien in that squalid and dismal place, toppled lazily into the chasm. Snickrat cackled 
as many zombies emerged from the tunnels and were pushed into the chasm by the mindless ranks that came after. His strategy had worked perfectly. At least, that is what he would tell Lord Feskid. The intruders were now stymied by the chasm, and the Skaven could bombard them at their leisure. Snickrot ordered the Warplock weapons teams along the ledge to open fire, and then strutted away to inform Feskid of his success. The severing of the bridge was at last reason enough for Manfred to involve himself personally in the battle. By no means had all the tunnels collapsed during the fighting, and the Lord of Sylvania and his knights now rode down through the widest of those that remained. By the time he reached the chasm, a small army of clanrat weaponeers had assembled on the far ledge. The air was full of the stench of crude skaven black powder, and resounded to the whine and crash of warpstone bullets hammering across the divide. The zombies made no attempt to avoid the fire, because Manfred had not willed them to do so, and a great heap of shattered bodies had built up on the edge of the abyss. Ordering his Templars to remain in the comparative safety of the tunnel, Manfred dismounted and strode to the edge of the precipice, seemingly careless of his danger. On catching sight of the vampire, Many of the Skaven weaponeers brought their weapons to bear on him. Most fired too hastily, and shots wasted their fury on stone or on the flesh of zombies. However, one Giselle Gunner's aim was true, and with a sharp crack sent a chunk of warpstone spinning towards Manfred's skull. Without even appearing to take notice of the attack, the vampire twisted gracefully to one side, and the bullet hammered past him. Manfred stood motionless, ignoring the missiles whistling around him, his whole concentration bent on drawing the magic from the rocks of the cavern and from the shards of extended warpstone. Nothing happened at first, but then the corpses that lay thick about his feet began to move. As one, the bullet riddled and fire-blackened dead hauled themselves upright and walked towards the edge of the chasm. Some were struck by shots from the far side and collapsed, but still they crawled on. As the first zombies reached the brink, Manfred gave a sharp twist of his hand. The wave of undead shuddered as their bones twisted into jagged and unnatural shapes, reforming into jagged spears that burst free of the ruined flesh and anchored deep into the bedrock. The next zombies approached the edge, and there was a wet tearing sound as they too slewed off their flesh. This wave did not latch onto the ledge as their predecessors had, but crawled over and anchored onto those who had come before. More and more zombies staggered through the hail of bullets and, moment by moment, the bridge of bloody bone grew. The weapons teams on the far side of the chasm were not fools. Their rate of fire quickened as the ghastly bridge took shape. Not one could bring a shot to bear on Manfred, and any holes they battered in the bridge were quickly filled by the zombies that came after. Still they struggled on, loading and firing for all they were worth. Pistols and gisales and rattling guns hammered shot after shot across the gap. In their haste, some grew careless, and booming coughs rang out across the chasm as weapons started to misfire, often crippling or killing the wielder on side. Others began to take a pace backward after every shot, shrinking steadily away from the approaching doom. They would have done better to flee outright. As the final jagged bones dug into the rock on the Skaven side, Manfred swung up on his saddle and loosed the Drakenhof Templars to the charge. The bridge of bones shook as the vampire knights charged across its ghastly deck, but it held. Seeing death riding hard towards them, the Skaven released one last volley, abandoned their weapons, and fled into the tunnel beyond. Not one of the ratmen made it more than twenty paces before the lance of a Templar plunged into its spine or skull. Without pause, Manfred swept down into the tunnel beyond. The Lord of Sylvania wanted this business done. He could feel the claw of Nagash throbbing with power as it drew nigh to its nemesis. The fell blade was close. At the far end of the tunnel, in the great cavern fortress of Clan Mordkin, Snickrat lay dying, his throat torn out by Feskid's teeth. The warlord was outraged. He had at least expected a competent defense from his underling, 
but Snickrat's failure ensured he would now have to face the vampire on his very doorstep. Fiskit could win, he knew that, but he had already lost thousands of clan rats to the undead, and it seemed victory would be even more costly before the end. Over the hours that followed, Fesket drove his minions into the tunnels in his attempt to drive the vampire away. There were mutated beasts purchased at great expense from Clan Mulder, weapon ears from Clan Skyri, turned tails from other warlord clans, seven whole regiments of storm vermin, and slave and clan rats almost beyond counting. All told, it might be sufficient to invade a large city, but it wasn't enough to stop the intruders. The vampire and his knights far outmatched the defenders, even when outnumbered six or seven times over, and the confines of the tunnels prevented Fesket's chieftains from bringing greater advantage to the bear. And the confines of the tunnels prevented Fesket's chieftains from bringing greater advantage to bear. Worse, those whom the invaders slew soon twitched to fresh life and assailed their former comrades. It was bad enough when the arisen were mere clan rats, but the vampire had possessed the gall to reanimate the abomination that had, before its death upon the points of a dozen lances, been Fiskit's pride and joy. The beast thrashing crushed nearly two score storm vermin before it finally perished for a second time. Fiskit was dismayed that his underlings could not accomplish the task before them, and many times considered commanding the defense personally. Each time, he reminded himself of how Clan Mordkin would suffer were he slain, and sent another chieftain out to take his place. The problem was, he was running out of underlings to send. Fiskit had started by sending out those of dubious loyalty, like Snickrat. When they had perished under the tide of dead, the warlord had dispatched those chieftains that he almost trusted, and when those two perished, he even allowed those he considered loyal to risk themselves in battle. All failed. All died. Soon the invaders were nigh to the fortress lair's walls, and Fesket had little choice but to risk the prosperity of his clan by going personally into battle. Consoling himself with the high token price of vampire ash, Fesket ordered the gates sealed. He had one weapon that would lay the intruder low, and he now went to claim it. Manfred arrived before the high walls of the fortress lair and sighed theatrically. The walls were, like all Skaven constructions, a derelict mismatch of building materials. Hardly a challenge to one who had humbled some of the finest fortresses the Empire had to offer. The Lord of Sylvania had no doubt that he could overcome the walls, even under the barrage of mortar fire and warp lightning that was beginning to spit forth from the lopsided towers, but it would take time and every hour lost was one in which Arkan could return to Sylvania to wreak mischief. For the briefest of moments, Manfred considered attempting a parley with the Skaven Warlord, then decided he couldn't bear to speak with a verminous fool. It would have to be a conventional siege, he decided. They were dead enough in the upper passages to overcome the walls if he roused them to it. Then the vampire's eyes drifted across the gates again, and he smiled a thin smile. Fesket had just emerged from the cave that served as his scavenger pile when the screams began. In his claws of one hand, he held his trusty blade. In the other, a sword of warpstone-laced Gromril, a sword that had come into his possession over a decade ago, shortly after he had slain the previous ruler of Clan Mordkin in single combat. Feskin had only taken up the weapon a handful of times in all the years since, partly because he feared one of his loyal underlings slaying him for the blade, but chiefly because he always felt strangely drained whenever he set the sword aside. He had only learnt of the weapon's true provenance some years later, after paying an extraordinary quantity of warp tokens to a blind seer who had assured him that this was the fell blade of legend, slayer of kings, and worse than kings and bringer of madness and death to any who wielded it. Feskit had not taken up the blade since that day, fearing what harm it might wreak upon him. But he had always known that he would be driven to risk its use again. Besides, he had convinced himself moments before those who had been driven to madness by the blade were clearly weaklings, 
pale imitators whose will was but a shadow of his own. Veskit would master the Fellblade where others had failed. He would slaughter this meddlesome vampire and set his skull atop a banner. Across the Under Empire, all would know that Feskit of Mordkin was a power with which to be reckoned. Then the warlord reached the refuse choked ward beyond the main walls and realized that the vampire was no longer his chief problem. Feskit beheld the sight before him with a mixture of rage and despair. His fortress lair, proud bastion of Cloud Mornkin these past millennia, had been breached. Plate-armored knights, some with the pallid flesh of vampires, some with no flesh to speak of at all, rode hither and yon behind the walls, their lances and swords tearing through the clanrats and storm vermin who battled to keep them at bay. In the gaping ruin where the gate had once stood, a lone figure sat astride a horse of bones, his cloak twitching as the spirit bound to the cloth strove hopelessly to escape. As to the gate itself, the mortal realms of Isragar, empowered by dark sorcery, now roamed at will behind the walls, wreaking a long sort of bloody vengeance on the descendants of those who had eaten his flesh. Fesket watched with mounting horror as a reanimated dragon reared up, sank its claws into the flank of a tower, and pulled the whole structure down in a shower of rubble and screaming clan rats. Feskit's eyes twitched back towards the ruin of the gate, searching for the architect of his woes, but his gaze had lingered too long on the dragon, and Manfred was no longer there. In most confrontations, the Lord of Salvania took cruel delight in toying with his opponents, mocking the dueling culture of the man he had once been, but not now. The vampire knew well the fell blade's power, and had no intention of facing its wielder, even though he was a fourth-rate leader of a craven race in anything that bore a passing resemblance to a fair fight. Warned by an instinct born of a lifetime of distrust, Feskit span around to see that the vampire was now standing at his side. With a cry of defiance and frustration, the warlord swung the fellblade in a mighty arc. Had the blow landed, it would have cloven even the supernaturally resistant vampire in two but it was an eternity too slow. With contemptuous ease, Manfred stepped inside the arc of the swing, locked one hand around the warlord's forearm, and snapped it back in one savage motion. In the same moment, the vampire thrust the point of his own sword through the warlord's rusted breastplate and scabrous torso. Feskit screamed and collapsed to his knees, the fell blade clattering to the ground. The warlord cradled the mangled bones of his forearm with his free hand, but blood, too much blood, was gushing from the wound and pooling at his feet. With a last whimper, warlord Fesket of Clan Mordkin toppled forward into his own sticky gore. Plucking the fell blade from Fesket's bloodied corpse, Manfred climbed back atop his mount and called for his knights to withdraw. Then, ignoring the skaven who still fought across the length and breadth of the cavern, he turned his back on the battered fortress lair and began the long trek to the surface. His parting gift to both Ithragar and to the skaven of Clan Mordkin was enough magic to sustain the dragon's tooth-gnawed bones for several days to come, but as to which would emerge the victor, Manfred cared not. The Lord of Sylvania had his prize, and there was yet much work to be done. Nagash would rise, and Manfred would rule. When Arkan and Manfred returned to Castle Staniste, they should have known quiet satisfaction in their achievements. Alkanash and the fell blade were now in their possession, and only Morakain, the black armor of Nagash, remained to be recovered from the bowels of Heldenheim Keep. As matters transpired, however, neither Lich nor Vampire was much inclined towards celebration, if indeed they any longer knew the meaning of the word. Arkan the Black brooded on Kemla's betrayal and what it portended. Through the long decades of their association, the Hitchmaster had ever been a vain and inconstant ally, but Arkan had never suspected that Kemla's true allegiance lay with chaos. Indeed, he had long thought the Lichmaster guided, or at least manipulated, by spirit of Nagash. So long had Arkan been in Nagash's service, 
that he no longer knew nor cared whether his desire to bring about the great necromancer's return was his own goal, or whether he too was being manipulated. Arkham was simply aware that his purpose was to bring Nagash's return. And that purpose had driven him onwards for centuries now, not in the frenetic manner that the zealous living pursued their chosen causes, but with a cold, calculating determination. If Arkan felt even a trace of excitement at this long-held goal coming to fruition, he did not acknowledge it. The Lich Master's last words were often at the forefront of Arkan's mind. Kemler's implication had been that his treacherous actions had been carried out at the behest of the Chaos Guards. At the time, Arkan had dismissed those words as the boast of a triumphant braggart. He had not believed that the Dark Gods would seek to intervene so directly in order to prevent Nagash's return, but intervene they had, and not just through Kemler. The final part of Arkan's return journey to Castle Stianeste had taken him through the Great Forest, and it had seemed that every chaos-touched beast had been drawn to his path. A lesser being than Arkan would have been deceived into thinking the creatures had merely been lured by Alakanash's power, but the Lich had not been fooled. A grim intelligence had guided the beastman to his trail. Arkan had seen the creature just once, during a rain-lashed battle on the Liesk Road. As the beastman had fled once more in disarray, the Lich had caught a glimpse of a winged shaman far to the rear of the frothing herd, bellowing in a crude tongue as it tried to stem the retreat. With new clarity, Arkan considered some of the misfortunes that had dogged his steps, and those of his allies in recent decades. The Lich had spent long years grooming Malabord into a worthy pawn through which he could bend Bretonia to his will. Arkan had brought the half-prince power, wealth, and had even arranged for him to receive the blood kiss of the vampire. Yet, just as the rebellion had been due to begin, Malabord's stronghold of Musulon had been beset by demons. Though the servants of the Chaos Guards had gone on to ravage much of Bretonia, the ravaging of Musalon had set back Malabord's plans, and therefore Arkan's, by almost a year. By the same token, Arkan wondered how Balthazar Gelt had come by the knowledge to forge his wall of faith. The Lich acknowledged that the Supreme Patriarch was a brilliant mind, by the lesser standards of mortals, at least. But Sylvania had long been a thorn in the Empire's side, and to contain it thus only now smacked of convenient timing. Was Gelt also an agent of chaos? Arkan dismissed the idea as preposterous. No servant of the Dark Gods could have shackled the power of Sigmar as he had. But that did not mean that he was not an unknowing pawn. And what of the Silver Pinnacle, dwelling place of the third and final servant of Nagash to have survived the centuries? That too had been beset by demons, might even have fallen to them so far as Arkan now knew. Indeed. If Krell had been destroyed by the elves of Athel Lauren, an eventuality that the Lich conceded was possible, it could very well be that Arkan the Black was now the last of the nine Dark Lords to walk the mortal world. Were the Chaos Gods so afraid of Nagash that they were acting to prevent his return? The idea seemed unlikely. But whatever else Arkan was, he was no creature of whimsy and wild imaginings. Given recent events, such deeds were not only possible, but likely. Nevertheless, the Lich resolved to say nothing of this to Manfred von Karstein. At best, the vampire would assume that Arkan had been consumed by paranoia. At worst, the Lord of Sylvania would believe the tale so completely that he would abandon their current course and seek other routes to power. Vampires were predators, after all and reacted poorly when they became the prey of beings more powerful than themselves. For his part, Manfred was already displeased with his ally, and for good reason. The apostatic enchantment was failing. Arkan's assurances that losing one of the nine would have negligible effect had proven hollow. With every day that passed, the enchantment weakened, its dark magics were slipping away, and Manfred could do nothing to abate this passage. It would take days, perhaps weeks, before the enchantment failed entirely, but when it did, the Church of Sigmar would make its move. Witch hunters, zealous madmen, and firebrand priests would prowl Sylvania once again, 
In the meantime, Gelt's wall of faith stood as impenetrable as it ever had, and showed no signs of weakening. When Manfred had confronted the Lich, the other had denied any foreknowledge of the enchantment's failure, but had simply proclaimed that Nagash's return would render such things unnecessary. Manfred knew the truth of the matter. Arkan had always known that this would occur, and had done nothing to prevent it. The Lich doubtless thought that it would force the vampire's unwavering commitment to the task at hand, and, though the Lord of Sylvania was loath to admit it, Arkan was quite correct in his assumptions. Manfred was no fool. He had seen the portents, and in the ruin of the border princes, he had seen the first consequences. The world was changing. That much was clear. And if Manfred wished to ensure that Sylvania remained a power in the times to come, he would have to continue along his current course. He would not, however, surrender rule of his realm, not to Nagash, and certainly not to the Lich who seemed determined to play the Lord of Sylvania for a fool. It was time to remind Arkan of who was the true master of the undead, and the attack on Heldenheim Keep presented a suitable opportunity. From the battlements of Castle Sneneste's tallest tower, Manfred set his voice and his will upon the winds, calling forth every unholy creature that owed him allegiance. Bat-winged monstrosities emerged from dank caves. The ghouls slunk from their charnel pits at his call. Chill-hearted spirits felt the touch of Manfred's mind and abandoned their haunts, unable to resist he who was their master. Before midnight had passed a day hence, a mighty army marched north from Castle Steneste. Manfred and Arkan travelled at its head, the former still seething angrily at the Lich's deception, the latter silently amused by the vampire's display of unbridled dominion. They would need such power if they were to emerge victorious at Heldenheim Keep. The Fall of Heldenheim the Knights of Sigmar's blood had founded Heldenheim Keep seven centuries earlier, when the Order had returned from the Arabian Crusades, enriched by stolen wealth. It had been a modest bastion then, with little more than a stone tower and a wooden palisade as its defences. However, as the Order of Sigmar's blood grew richer and more renowned, so too did their fortress grow to new magnificence. First the keep itself was expanded, then the palisade, replaced by a broad stone wall. A century later, the fortress was further enlarged. The wall was extended to protect the town that had grown prosperous in the order's shadow, and the keep itself was torn down and replaced by a sprawling castle many times larger. Now Heldenheim Keep was the grandest fortress in Talabakland. The town was a bustling city, and the merest gatehouse of the city wall stood far taller and more intimidating than the long-vanished keep from whence the name Heldenheim had sprung. Though neither Manfred nor Arkan admitted it, they both saw the conquest of Heldenheim as no small challenge. Indeed, had time been less precious, they might have sought methods other than conquest to retrieve Morricane from the fortress's trophied vaults, Manfred had already investigated the possibilities before journeying to the border princes. Even while Sylvania's borders closed, he had informants and spies enough in every city in the Empire. Unfortunately, every scrap of information the vampire could garner told him exactly the same thing. The Knights of Sigmar's blood would be difficult to infiltrate and almost impossible to corrupt. Manfred and Arkan had time for neither, though each had their own reasons to make haste. Arkan feared the growing opposition of the Chaos Guards, while the vampire needed the power of the great necromancer harnessed to his will to defend and expand Sylvania in the coming days of trial. Heldenheim would have to be taken, and quickly. While Manfred's informants had brought many poor tidings from Heldenheim, they had at least managed to learn of a weakness in the fortress's defences, a large battered span along the city's western wall. Only the previous year, the green tide of War Bloodtooth had broken upon the stone of Heldenheim, and, though the greenskins had been slaughtered or driven off, this halt had battered the western wall almost to the point of collapse. Hans Leitdorf, the current Grand Master of the Order, had spared no expense making good the damage, but such repairs were hard to rush. A determined bombardment of the west wall, or so the informant said, 
would swiftly yield a breach. They also cautioned, however, that Lightdorf had greatly reinforced the garrison of that wall with several batteries of non-forged cannon, the better to destroy any attackers seeking to exploit the weakness. Neither Manfred nor Arkin were particularly enamoured of so obvious an assault, but concluded that predictability, or at least the appearance of the same, was as valuable a weapon as its absence, if properly employed. As night fell, and the citizens of Heldenheim slumbered in their beds, Arkin walked the steep slope beneath the western wall. The worms had fed well from the previous year's siege. The lich could sense thousands of dead beneath his feet, waiting impatiently to be roused to fight again. But Arkin knew that it would take more than swords and spears to take the wall. It would take artillery too. Carefully selecting a spot where the dead lay particularly deep, the lich planted his staff in the ground and began to whisper in the ancient Nehekaran tongue. The restless wind brought occasional snatches of Arkin's chant to the midnight watch stationed along the wall. Those who heard them made the sign of the hammer for protection against the evil spirits lurking in the dark, and longed for the sun to return. As dawn broke, Otto Cross, commandant of the city garrison, was stirred for wakefulness by his second-in-command. Cross was not pleased to be awoken thus. He had drunk well the previous night, and his dreams had been haunted by Lysam and accommodating Bretonian maiden when Captain Dainroth's insistent hand had dragged him back into the waking world. Cross was about to launch into a stream of invective when the familiar sound of battle permeated the fog surrounding his brain. The sharp crack of cannons, the screams of round shot hurtling through the air, and there was something else as well. Short snatches of a wild and maddening sound that was half laughter and half scream. The city was under attack. Cursing his sore head, Cross dressed swiftly and left his quarters at a run, or as close to as he could manage. Minutes later, he had joined the troops and wind-whipped banners on the western ramparts and was staring down at the nightmare below. The approach to the wall was thick with worm-picked skeletons, their dead hands clasped grimly around the hills of swords or the staves of spears. They were distant but steadily advancing. Further back, on the edge of the tree line, Cross could make out the shape of catapults, their silhouettes too rough and uneven for them to have been made of wood or steel. As he watched, the torsion arms of the war engine snapped upwards, and two dozen flaming comets trailed across the sky towards him. The fireballs screeched as they approached, not the whistling of boulders being propelled at high speed, but an insane and tormented cackle that set Cross's teeth on edge. One of the shots fell short, gouging a muddy smear through the slope below, another sailed high over the commandant's head, slamming into a tavern and setting its timbers alight. The rest of the missiles struck the wall, either shattering against its face or dashing themselves to pieces on the rampart. Cross saw one land in amongst a regiment of hand gunners, there to explode in a spray of blood and bone. Perhaps a dozen men perished in that one shot but Cross was more worried about the impacts against the wall on which he stood. The attackers were clearly aiming for the scaffolded and ragged tear a few paces south of the Rostromir bastion. There was no facing stone there to defend the wall's core, and with each strike, more rubble trickled into the slopes below. Cross saw a cannonball plough through a mass of skeletons in the middle distance, and he bellowed at the gun crews to ignore the advancing infantry and concentrate on the catapults beyond. The undead had not brought siege towers or scaling equipment of any kind, at least so far as he could see. If the war engines were destroyed, the walls would defeat the attackers. Cross had seen it happen the previous year, and was sure he would see it again today. The pounding in his head forgotten, Cross began issuing orders. Garrisons were ordered to abandon their posts on the other walls and hurry westward. Marksmen were sent to the upper levels of the Rostmere and Sigmundus bastions, where their view of the enemy would not be impeded by the clouds of acrid gun smoke already billowing across the walls. The catapults were beyond the official range of the Hochland long rifle, but all it took was a lucky bullet to bring down a crewman. Messengers were sent to the castle, informing Grand Master Lightdorf of the situation and requesting him to mobilize his order. Some knights were already on the walls. But Cross reckoned a sally might yet end this sudden siege in a swift and decisive manner. The marksmen had just begun firing 
when a great cheer went up from the rampart. A gust of wind had temporarily snatched a veil of smoke aside, granting the defenders a clear view as a cannonball guided by a gunner's sergeant's experienced eye struck their leftmost upright on one of the distant catapults. Shattered bones flew in all directions as the massive torsion forces within the catapult's frame met sudden release. The machine tore itself and its crew apart in a whirl of fragments and flailing ropes. The defenders cheered again, hearkened at having struck meaningfully against a foe. Then, tendrils of dark magic emerged from the tree line to enfold the crippled catapult. Shattered spars remade themselves. The crewmen who had been torn asunder returned to their station, and as the wind slackened once again and the mist hid the catapults from view, the cheering atop the city walls faded and died. For a time after that, there was nothing for Cross and most of his men to do but take shelter behind the ramparts and endure the bombardment while their cannons and marksmen traded fire with the catapults. The Empire gunners had the range now and hammered round shot after round shot at the enemy war machines. Each time a cannonball struck home, the walls had a fleeting reprieve, but it lasted only until Arkan sorcery undid the fruits of those desperate labours. Again and again, the cackling missiles slammed into the weakened walls or sent fire coursing across the ramparts. Only Janos Odkrier, a stern-faced priest of Sigma, who had confronted the horrors of Sylvania many times, stood tall amidst the onslaught. With no sign of weakness, he strode the span between the Rostmir and Sigis and Sigmundus bastions and, where he walked, Men felt the terrors of the siege ease. At last, Lookout shouted warning that the skeletons had advanced into handgun range, and Cross gave the order to open fire. As sergeants took up the cry, the battered defenders rose to their feet, pulled hard on their triggers, and rained fire onto the slope below. Balls of lead hammered into the unholy mass, shattering bone and tearing through the invisible magics that took the place of flesh. Soon the approach to the wall was thick with gun smoke, but the volleys continued. The handgunners loaded and fired, loaded and fired, always with the determination of men who knew that their survival depended on their swiftness. They did not aim now, for the smoke from their own volleys made that impossible, but fired at whatever shadow loomed through the swirling shroud, certain that the enemy was so thick clustered that no shot would be wasted. Through it all, the catapults kept firing, the defenders hardly noticed, each man fighting on until he was swept from the wall. Halberdiers hurried fresh ammunition to the walls and toppled the dead over the parapets so the living could take their place. Their weapons were useless until the ramparts were assailed, and it seemed to Cross that no such assault could take place. He had seen no siege towers and no ladders for escalade. The Commandant's spirits were rising. A messenger had at last brought word to him that the Knights of Sigmar's blood had left the city through the south gate and would soon carry their lances against the besiegers. As far as Cross was concerned, the skeletons could mill around beneath the walls as much as they wished. Fate makes a mockery of surety, and it laughed loud and long at Cross that day. No sooner had the Commandant assured himself that no assault would be made upon the walls than the mass of skeletons below surged into fresh activity. Gripped with sudden purpose, they clambered and climbed over one another like a swarm of ants, building on living ladders of bone and magical sinew that grew taller and taller by the moment. In this manner, the tide of dead clambered up the walls of the Rostmere and Sigmundus bastions, their skeletal hands grasping ever for the ramparts. Handguns barked and flamed, shattering sections of the growing construct and toppling the uppermost climbers to the ground far below. Cross had two batteries of hellbasters, one on each of the bastions, and those now gouted smoke and lead into the foe. Each battery fired not in the defence of its own bastion, the gun barrels would not depress enough for that, but directed its fury to save the other, firing across the expanse of wall that separated the two towers. Bone fragments clattered against stone as the volley tore the heart out of the unliving ladder. A ragged cheer sounded again from the battlements, but then skeins of dark magic flickered through the gun smoke. The dead hauled their broken bodies back together, and the escalade began again. Cross bellowed at his gunners to reload, but it was no good. 
the same magic that had healed the skeletons had lent them fresh vigour. Here and there a gun flamed, but the pace of the ascent barely slowed. Some handgunners abandoned any attempt at reloading and heaved rocks over the ramparts to smash the skulls of the climbers. Most were pulled back from the brink by halberdiers who took their places to hack down at the attackers. The time for gunplay upon the bastions was ended. Now was the hour of steel. On the Rostmere bastion, the undead could find no lasting purchase. Captain Dainroth led the defence there, and, so thinned were the skeletal ranks from the Hellblaster volley, that steel and courage saw the walls kept clear. The Sigmundus bastion was not so fortunate. One of the Hellblasters positioned on the Rostmere bastion was famously cantankerous and had malfunctioned badly during the firing. A volley that should have been thunderous lost all force well short of its target, and the swarm of skeletons that reached the ramparts of Sigmundus was far less eroded than that which assailed Rostmere. All along the length of the parapet, skeletal arms reached up out of the smoke to assail the defenders with rusted swords and gasping hands. Halberds gleamed as they thrust down, but for every skeleton whose bones clattered away down the face of the bastion, two rose up to take its place. Soon Arkhan's minions gained their first bloody foothold upon Heldenheim's defences. Slowly, inexorably, the defenders of Singbundus' bastion were driven back, and perhaps would have fled entirely had it not been for the arrival of Father Odkrier, whose faith was alight in that dark moment. The old priest swung his great hammer with the fury of a much younger man, and where it struck undead bone, it blazed like the twin-tailed comet of yore. Odkrier's doughty example roused the men of Talapheim and Talabakland to fresh bravery, and a motley band of halberdiers, handgunners, and artillerymen followed in his wake, determined to retake the bastion. As he advanced, however, the priest strayed too close to the parapet, and bony hands from below latched onto his cloak. Okria tore free and smashed his hammer downwards, but more arms crested the battlement and clutched at his arms and legs. With a last oath of defiance, the warrior priest was plucked from the bastion and torn apart by the vengeful dead. With Odkria's loss, the sparks of defiance faded from Sigmundus's defenders. Abandoning the bastion to the attackers, they flooded north and south along the walls, seeking shelter in Heldenheim Castle or amongst Cross's men. Cross watched in horror as the defenders of the Sigismundus bastion fled. Behind him, at the foot of the inner wall, Captain Volker had at least brought in reinforcements from the unassailed eastern front. However, there was no way that they could mount the wall in time to stop the spill of dead that was even now falling upon Cross's right flank. Things could not get worse, or so the Commandant thought, as he pushed his way through to join the fight. Once again, fate heard Cross's surety and made a mockery of it. As another wave of missiles slammed into the battered walls, the battlements lurched beneath Cross's feet. His mind lost in battle, the Commandant didn't realize the significance of the shudder at first, thinking it merely another impact upon the wall. Then the battlements lurched again, and the awful reality sank in. Cross yelled at his men to fall back towards the Rosmere bastion, to clear the ramparts, but his warning came too late. With a mournful rumble and a great gout of dust, the center of the wall at last collapsed, spilling rubble and mangled bodies across the newly created breach. Robbed of the central section support, the destruction spread along the wall, buckling the ramparts and tearing them apart. Men and skeletons alike were thrown over the battlements or toppled to their doom amongst the spoil. Cross died amongst the destruction, bellowing with frustrated fury as he tumbled helplessly to his death. Behind the wall, Captain Volker was aghast, but the sight of skeletons climbing methodically over the dust-choked breach quickly snapped him back to his senses. This was the last chance to contain the undead. If they spilled into the city streets, the slaughter would increase tenfold. Drawing his sword of fine creek steel, Volker kissed the twin-tailed comet embossed upon its hilt and threw his men forward. There was not a man in Volkar's ranks who did not feel the icy grip of fear at that moment. But every one of them had family behind the walls, and they knew that there was no one else to stem the tide. Giving voice to a mighty battle cry, 
They hurled themselves up the rubble slope, scattering the skeletons in their path. They surged on to the crest of the breach, and there formed a ragged line of swords and spears, which tightened moment by moment as sergeants bellowed the formations into shape. Volker's line was barely formed when the next attack wave struck, but it held. The skeletons came on mindlessly, their only actions the half-remembered motions of the beings they had once been. They attacked in silence and perished the same way. Men gave wailing screams and collapsed as ragged spears ripped through their flesh. Others fought on through the pain, spitting and snarling defiance until their last breath left them. Soon the crest of the breach was slippery with blood and strewn with shattered bones. Through it all, the catapults continued to fire. Much of their fury was directed against the Rostmere Bastion, whose defenders now poured fire down into the breach, but every few moments a cackling fireball would plunge into the melee upon the slope, for the undead cared not if they hit their own kind, so long as enemies perished alongside them. Though he took pains not to show it, and fought on no less furiously than he had before, Volker had begun to despair. His flesh was scored along one side from where a catapult shot had torn away the three files of men to his right, and he was bleeding from a deep wound on his scalp. Perhaps half of the captain's men had already fallen, but he could see no end to the attackers. Little by little, Volker's ranks were gaining reinforcements, survivors from the war's collapse and stragglers from his own march across the town, but these new forces didn't bring him any closer to victory. They merely slowed the pace of defeat. Where were the knights? The captain wondered. If they did not come soon, it would be too late. Far to the east, from his vantage point deep in the tree line, Arkan was greatly pleased by how the battle was unfolding. He'd never expected both the bombardment and the escalade to succeed, but succeed they had, and gloriously so. Yet it would all be for nothing if the Knights of Sigmar's blood refused to take the bait. Arkan had suggested this diversionary attack in order to thin Heldenheim Castle's defenders, and... While the Lich didn't care whether Manfred's forces suffered in the assault, it would be disastrous to his purpose if it failed. It was unthinkable that the knights would seal themselves in their castle and leave their city to burn. The mortal conceit of honor and chivalry could surely not allow it. Then a blare of trumpets pealed through the air, and Arkan knew his plan was unfolding. Yet even now, he felt no satisfaction, just an infinitely distant pity for the humans who had proven themselves so predictable. Hans Leitdorf also felt no satisfaction as his trumpet sounded the charge. It had taken far too long for his knights to reach the city walls, and it seemed to the Grand Master that every merchant's cart in Heldenheim had been strategically placed to slow his order's progress. That this was manifestly untrue helped Leitdorf's temper not one whit. He felt the loss of the city's outer wall as a personal failure, and one for which victory would only partially atone. As a result, when Lightdorf's leading brotherhoods rounded the southwest corner of the city wall and beheld the thousands of skeletons advancing on the bridge, the Grand Master saw not an enemy to be feared, but a target upon which to vent his righteous anger. The trumpet clarion sounded for the third time, and the column of knights began to move forward. Nearly the entire order rode under Lightdorf's command, the rest stood sentinel over Heldenheim Castle itself, or abroad on the order's business, but they were not missed that day. Once loose to the charge, a full-plate armoured knight was nothing less than a battering ram of metal and flesh whose impact could break the thickest of shield walls. Leitdorf had nearly twelve hundred such knights at his command, and with a bellow of vengeance, he loosed them against the skeleton legions beneath Heldenheim's walls. So swift and destructive did the nightly charge strike home that to Captain Volker it seemed as if the Reaper's scythe had again come for the unliving host before him. In one moment there was a sea of bleached bones and ragged banners. In the next, the middle distance was awash with shining steel and shields, the color of spilt blood, and the thunder of hooves melded with a crack and splinter of bone. Given fresh hope by the night's arrival, Volker hacked down at the grinning skull in front of him and pressed forward into the gap. Even then, the defenders of Heldenheim could have fallen to Arkan's legions had recklessness overtaken them, 
but Lightdorf wielded the weapon that was his order with incomparable skill that day. Again and again, the Knights of Sigmar's blood crunched skeleton phalanxes into fragments, only to wheel in good order and charge home against a fresh target. Catapults still fired from the tree line, and even the steel plate of knightly armor could not defend against their impact. But Lightdorf loosed two brotherhoods of his knights to smash the war engines to splinters. Soon the catapults fell silent, and in the flush of a victory hard won, no one thought to question why the dead did not rise again as they had earlier in the battle. The answer was, of course, that Arkan had made his escape in the moment Lightdorf's charge had first struck home, that it had played his part to perfection, and it was time for Manfred to play his. Hans Lightdorf knew that something was wrong when the wind suddenly shifted. All morning, a listless easterly breeze had played across the city, but now a gale of buffeted the city from the north, its gusts howling with unholy voices. The Grand Master looked on with mounting wrath as black clouds gathered round Heldenhink Castle, and he knew in that moment that his trials had not yet ended. Knowing even then he would be too late, Lightdorf set spurs to his charger's flanks and, calling his brothers to follow with all haste, charged over the breach and back into the city, scattering Volker's surviving defenders aside as he did so. Even with its knights elsewhere, Heldenheim Castle could have withstood a conventional assault for months, though many of Heldenheim's castellans, swordsmen and handgunners recruited from the surrounding land and trained by the knights they served, had been dispatched to aid the defense of the Western Wall Near four hundred still manned the walls, and they knew their duty well. The walls were thick, and the artillery towers were well served. No barbaric horde or outland army could crack Heldenheim's castle defenses, or so the boast went. And even with the city's western walls collapsed and broken, the castellan's resolve did not falter. They took their lead from the Knights of Sigmar's blood, who commanded the defenses in Lightdor's absence, and strove to prove themselves worthy. Alas, for them, Manfred had no intention of resorting to conventional assault. Vargeists came first, diving from the teeth of the gale onto battlements little prepared for an assault from the skies. Handguns flamed, but few men could hold their aim in those howling winds, and but a handful of the attackers were punched from the skies. The rest tore across the battlements in an orgy of blood and hunger tearing at the members of the denuded garrison with razor-sharp claws and casting the survivors onto the rocks below. Still the castellans held their ground. Though daunted by their casualties, the defenders saw that the advantage of numbers lay with them. Drawing their swords, they hunted across the ramparts and towers, through passageways and barrack rooms, overwhelming the bestial attackers with weight of numbers and desperate steel. But the Vargeists were not the only weapons in Manfred's arsenal. He had others at his disposal, which he now loosed to the battle. At the vampire's unspoken command, spectral shapes flowed over the rocks dotted with broken bodies of the castle's defenders. These were the ghostly echoes of ancient warlocks and witches, suicides and madmen. Long ago, they had possessed bodies. Now they were cruel spectres who yearned only to abate their own suffering by reveling in that of others. Through the walls they passed, and they fell eagerly upon defenders still reeling from the Vargeist attack. These immaterial creatures could not be harmed by mortal weapons, though the Castellans made every effort to prove otherwise, and their touch was enough to slay all but the bravest. Now the defenders died by the score, driven mad by the piercing soul-song of spectral witches, or their hearts stilled by the terror of a ghostly embrace. Now the defenders' salvation came from the weapons of the past, Many of the blades wielded by the Castellans had been forged during the Arabian Crusade and had been blessed against the infidel warriors of the desert kingdoms by the priests of those times. Those aged blades blazed like torches when the spirits drew near, and the flames burnt spectral flesh as easy as they did that of the living. Swiftly, the Castellans rallied around those of their number that carried the blessed weapons, and the spectral assault stalled. Then, at last... Manfred von Karstein came to the battle on a steed of twisted bone. Two Vargeist heralded his coming, dropping from the darkened sky into the center of the castle courtyard, with shrieks so piercing that every window, goblet, and mirror in the castle shattered. 
The monsters had no fear of the blessed blade, only a gnawing hunger that could never be sated. They knuckled their way across the stones, scooping terrified swordsmen into mighty jaws, seemingly unaware that the gory remains slithered back through their decaying gullets moments later. Manfred's lip crooked slightly at the delicious slaughter his minions had wrought, then the vampire turned away, his mind set to the search that had brought him here. Rudolf Vesker was the castle's seneschal, a great bear of a man whose efforts had seen the castle vaults remain unbreached throughout the assault. As Manfred dismounted, Wesker immediately recognized the vampire as the architect of Heldenheim's woes. Imploring Sigmar to lend him strength, Wesker rallied a handful of knights to his side and charged forward to smite the evil in their midst. The Seneschal had taken just five steps when one of the Terragars struck his flank. One knight was slain immediately, crushed beneath the creature's taloned foot, but the others held their ground and struck out at this new peril. Bones fractured and cracked as the knight's swords hacked down. The Terragai screeched and lashed out with membranous wings, sweeping two knights aside like broken dolls. Abandoning his shield, Wesker ducked low under a flailing wing and brought his sword around in a brutal two-handed strike against the monster's jaw. Bones splintered under the impact and the Terragai drew back, but it did so too slowly. Wesker stepped forward, raised his sword high, and shattered the creature's skull to fragments. As the Terragai collapsed into a heap of bone, Wesker turned again to face Manfred, and bellowing a challenge, threw himself towards the vampire once more. Manfred heard the battle cry as Wesker charged, but he saw no threat. Merely a desperate man who led an equally desperate rabble. He stalked forward to meet the charge head on, raising his sword in a mocking parody of the salute favored in this part of the empire. His first swing took off Wesker's head as cleanly as a cleaver carving a haunch. His second clove two knights into offal. Manfred felt the blade resonate with power as it tasted blood, and with the merest effort of will, he sent that magic spiraling outward to drain every drop of life essence from his opponents. The vampire lord sneered as the last of the attacking swordsmen fell, casting his gaze at the slaughter around him. Everywhere, the castle's defenders lay dead or dying, and those few that still lived were of no challenge to him. Ahead lay the entrance to Heldenheim's vaults and the prize he sought. No one could stop him now. Nagash would rise. Nagash would rise. Hans Leitdorf slammed his gauntleted fist against the parapet. He had been fooled, and Heldenheim, on a stronghold of his order for centuries, had paid the price. How many survivors? Leitdorf demanded. From where he stood on the North Tower, all he could see were the bodies of the dead. We pulled another three out from under the rubble of the gatehouse, replied the preceptor at his side. One will lose a hand, unless the surgeons are quick, but they'll all fight again. That makes one. Forty, all told? Forty-two, my lord, the preceptor corrected him. Lightdorf swore and punched the wall again. Forty-two survivors out of a garrison of four hundred, and that said nothing of the thousands who had died on the walls. Worse, the castle vault had been breached, and one of its oldest treasures stolen. The Order's honor was in the mud. His honor was in the mud. At least the identity of the perpetrator was clear. Indeed, it could hardly have been clearer. The cage is broken. Those were the words Lightdorf had found daubed in blood on the wall of the inner keep, and this less than three months after the Supreme Patriarch had proclaimed himself the man who had caged Sylvania. Lightdorf had argued long and hard that Gelt's solution was a temporary measure at best, but the Supreme Patriarch's gilded tongue had proved himself more persuasive than the knight's bitter years of experience along the Sylvanian borders. I've a mind to travel to Altdorf, and wring Balthazar Gelt's scrawny neck, Lightdorf growled. He wouldn't make good on this threat, of course. Even in his anger, Lightdorf knew that the wizards weren't their true enemy. Vengeance lay along the dark roads to Sylvania. No sane man would willingly take that path. Indeed, after his last journey into the haunted land, Lightdorf had sworn he would never return. 
Yet as he looked again at the bloodied bodies strewn across the inner courtyard, the Grand Master wondered if he perhaps bore a touch of his late brother's madness, for now he was considering just that. Spread the word, Ladolf ordered. We ride south at first light. The wizards have had their chance. We'll settle. His final words were drowned out when a crude blaring of horns sounded in the distance. Lightdorf knew that sound. Looking to the west, he saw that the trees, which had so recently been alive with undead, were now thick with braying beastmen, who trampled one another in their eagerness to reach Heldenheim's breached wall. They had been drawn by the sound of battle, Lightdorf guessed, come to pile further horror on Heldenheim. Not today, he swore, his anger rising to meet the threat. Vengeance would wait, at least for now. The end of chapter one.